Hello everyone. It is time for another live stream. And today we're going to do something a little different because I like changing things up. And I wanted to basically let you pick a topic. So I thought it'd be kind of fun today to have you tell me in the chat some topic you'd like me to discuss and we'll go into it. Maybe we'll talk about a few different ones versus me just coming up with um, a singular topic, which is usually my goal. Michael Wells, welcome. You are the first one to the stream. <laughs> I, uh, hey Adam, hi Jamie. I uh, was thinking, you know, a lot of times I have to come up with a topic and this week really I thought, well, let me open it up to you guys and you can tell me something you would like me to discuss. It doesn't have to be something super difficult. Um, there's a lot of you that are newer to the hobby and would love to have some inspiration <laughs> and some assistance. And so I'm not always looking for something that's really hardcore and difficult necessarily. So, you know, throw out your topic and maybe I'll pick it and uh, we can talk about that for a little bit. And then, you know, when we finish up that section or that segment, then we'll go into the question and answer part. But for now, yeah, po post up some topics. All right. We will take the first one here. Macy's daddy says, talk about anemones. Well, that works out because there's a video behind me <laughs> that shows anemones. And uh, so anemones are really great creatures that have a symbiotic relationship with specific fish. Uh, normally we're talking about clownfish, but there are some damsels that can live in them as well. And we don't want to combine too many. Now keep putting in your suggestions for topics. And remember also, please do put at me loves reef when you say something so I can find it in all the chatter. Um, I really like the bubble tip anemone because it's probably the easiest one for most hobbyists. And I'm not necessarily talking about the ones that are high dollar, which I know some of you are drawn toward because you're like, oh my God, it's so gorgeous, I need it. And then it's like, why is that $500? Like, that's a lot of money. So I would like to suggest that we uh, <clears throat> look at something reasonable, something you can afford, and put that in your tank and enjoy it and appreciate it for what it is and not really worry about that there's something way better. And let me just compare it to, there's a car in your driveway right now. I'm sure there's a way better car on this planet you'd love to have, but you don't have it and you're still okay with the car you have. So getting an anemone that's similar to, you know, that one, but not quite as great, totally fine. And my tank is filled up with these little guys. I mean, I'll scoot myself over here for a second. Let's see if I can do this. Shrink, shrinky dink. So, I mean, there's a bunch in there and it started off with one or two. <laughs> you know, it's not like I uh, went and bought a whole bunch. And I'll tell you, when you go shopping for them, I'm shocked at how small they are these days. You get these little tiny guys and I'm like, why are they so little? <laughs> And where are they finding these tiny things, you know? Because when we would buy them, they were a large size, and you'd put them in your tank, and they they became like a showpiece in your aquarium. And then, of course, you know, I have very specific uh, knowledge of only certain anemones. I can't talk about them all, because I don't know them all. Uh, thank you. I'm By the way, I'm, I'm kind of watching out of the corner of my eye all the topics coming up. <laughs> Lots of great topics. So I need someone to make a list. No, um, maybe Andrea can make me a list and uh, then spit them out at me through chat. That would work. Um, so first rule of thumb when it comes to anemones is not to put different ones together in the same tank. That doesn't always work out. And so if you've got your hopes on that, of mixing them all up and having long tentacle, bubble tip, sea bay, malu, uh, rock anemones, uh, tube anemones, if you're trying to have them all in there, usually some are not going to make it. And it, because it's chemical warfare, even if they're not touching each other, it's like the chemicals they put out into the water column itself can affect certain ones and make them worse and they'll just deteriorate. And then if you take them out of the tank and put them in a different one, they just seem to do fine. And that's how you can tell that allelopathy has taken place in your aquarium. And so even if you run a lot of carbon, trying to combine these species into one small biotope may not be, or pretty much isn't a good idea. So instead I'd recommend picking one you really like or a family you really like and sticking to that family. And even then, like I said, you, the, what you're seeing in this video <laughs> over here, I'm pointing the wrong direction. Uh, what you're seeing right there is all different size bubble tip anemones. That's all that's in the tank plus a couple of corals. And if, and when I had the sea bay in there, the sea bay shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. It got worse and worse and worse. And I removed it and I put it in the tank behind me, which right now in the stream just looks like a big white blob but you've seen it for years. And that has blossomed in this gorgeous 24 inch diameter anemone that all the skunk clownfish live in every single day. So I could not combine it. And you know, to be honest, when I bought it, I didn't think it was a sea bay. When it was sold to me, the seller told me it's a weird looking bubble tip. 
<laughs> I was like, I'll take it. And so I put it in my tank and then it turned out to not be one whatsoever. And it took a little while to identify it. And so, you know, that may happen. Uh, when it comes to feeding them, I usually don't. I like to feed the fish and let the fish feed the anemones on their own, whether they bring food to it or they poop all over it, you know, whichever how that works, that's fine. I'm not actually trying to put food in, but if you are going to feed them, you only have to feed them a little tiny bit. I don't recommend to anyone to like grab a big silver side and lay that in there and expect it to eat this fish or anything like that. I, no, I'd much rather see you feed them a little nugget of food uh, basically the size of a lima bean and do that little piece of meaty food, you know, shrimp, krill, something along those lines, maybe two times a week. Just a little bit of food. Uh, if you see food go into the anemone and then spit out a big blob, you fed it too much. I never see anemones poop in my systems. Ever. Never. Never, never. <laughs> and, you know, in the beginning when I was an early hobbyist or a new hobbyist, I was feeding them, you know, big pieces of meat and then they push out this big blob and I had to remove that blob and throw it away. And that's when I discovered they're only eating the outside part and the whole inner part was a waste. So by reducing the amount you're putting in the tank, you're actually reducing the pollution to your tank at the same time. So let me uh, move off of that one. Oh, that was a good one. That was cool. It was good timing with the video too. Let's see. There was another one I saw here that I liked. Okay, Mason says, can we talk about maricultured versus aquacultured? <clears throat> okay, so there's a difference between the two. Um, I'm probably going to screw it up um, because I don't buy a lot of stuff, so I'm not doing a lot of research. But I've read it, I learn it, and then I forget it. That's the problem. Um, maricultured, I believe, is when the coral or uh, livestock, well, mainly coral, is being, or actually it could be clams too, and things like that, are being... Um, collected and uh, harvested and grown out in the ocean and then brought into... Uh, oh, I'm probably screwing this up. Can I go to the next question? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it's one's from the ocean and one's from aquariums for like an aquaculture facility where it's a farm. And there's a difference, you know, so there's natural farms which are going to involve the ocean, which even involves live rock, where the rock was put in the ocean and cured for nine months or longer and divers went down and kept flipping it over until it was totally covered in coralline. It's got all kinds of sponges and cool worms and things. And then they bring that to land and sell it to us for our aquariums. Uh, there's companies out there that grow clams from the tiniest little eggs and sperms. And they have these adorable little tiny clams that become the nice sized clams that we like to buy. Uh, and that's better than just taking a clam from the ocean. These are clams grown for the aquarist. I believe that is in the maricultured uh, uh, moniker. And then, uh, like I said, aquacultured is going to be like getting corals from any vendor that sells them. Dr. Mack has been growing corals in greenhouses for years. Uh, Worldwide Corals has that giant facility in Florida where they're growing corals. There are fish store owners now that have their own private farms. I know of one myself that's setting one up now. Uh, there's there's that opportunity. And so is there a benefit of one over the other? Anything that doesn't just take straight from the ocean, it, put it in a bag and then send it to us and put it in our aquarium is probably a better, oh, well, it is a better route than to, you know, so to get something that's been grown for the hobbyists so that it's not just being pillaged from the ocean is great. And uh, we should embrace that. So it allows us to pick these things and, you know, choose what we want to buy. I don't, like I said, when I go to the fish store, I don't often ask a lot of questions. I might ask, what is that called or how much does it cost? I don't always say, well, where did it come from? You know, was it maricultured? Was it aquacultured? I don't really think that way. Um, probably because I so rarely buy stuff. It's just not on my list of considerations. But I, it's a good thing to start looking into, and maybe I should start doing more of it. Um... Moshe says, can you talk about tank maturity? Yeah, we have a really good live stream on that one. That one, uh, matter of fact, that stream was very popular. It had like, I don't know, 16,000 people watched it. And tank maturity is a uh, scenario where the tank has gotten to a certain point to where it's very stable. And I like to think of tank maturity also being hobbyist maturity. Because as your tank is getting older, you're getting wiser because you're learning the ins and outs of your aquarium and you're, you're not fighting it as hard. You're starting to get it. You're starting to recognize things from a distance. You can quickly hear something if it's different. You can smell something that's different. You can spot something from eight feet away and say, that's different. And you can kind of zone in on things and correct them more quickly and not have these huge swings in water parameters or temperature swings or, or just dumb mistakes that we make in the very beginning. And so I like to feel that the hobbyist becomes more and more mature 
and they become better hobbyists. They become better at their husbandry, and they they do better taking care of their livestock than they did initially. And you know that's not putting people down. When we don't know how to do something, we literally don't know how to do it, and we're probably going to do it wrong. And unfortunately, in this hobby that involves living things, so we have to you know we have a responsibility to be better at how we take care of these animals way more than we do anything else. Um, if the person got a used aquarium, for example, and it came with livestock, and they, they just said, okay, I, I've always wanted this hobby, this is a great deal, I'm going to save money, I'll buy it. And they bring it into their home, and they fill it up with the water that it came with, and they put all the animals in, and they join a Facebook group like Club Milo's Reef, and they say, I just got this tank, and I've got a copper band, I've got an octopus, I've got you know a sea apple, what do I do? The inclination people might have is, well, how dare you buy those animals? You don't even know what you're doing yet. And, you know, we don't want to be that way. And plus, that person might have bought it, and that was what was in the tank. So it wasn't like they just did something willy-nilly, other than just jump into a hobby. But when it comes to education and learning and finding out what's dangerous, or what's hard to keep, um, what could potentially be a disaster, you know, that's where these groups chime in. And same with forums, same with articles, same with books. These things help us be more educated so we can understand the ins and outs of our aquariums. And that is part of our own maturity that I feel each person so desperately needs to become better aquarists overall. I uh, would like to also emphasize that while I have a, I, we have a really nice group on Facebook, it's not the answer to everything. It's, it's a good answer to today, <laughs> but it's not a great way to be taught on a daily basis. I feel like you really should be a subscriber to Coral Magazine. I feel like you should really be buying books like Reef Invertebrates, The Conscientious Marine Aquarist, uh, Corals by Eric Borneman. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of good reading material that still applies to this day. Even if some of it's dated or some of it, you know, some of the gear that they talk about may not be available now because those books were written 10, possibly 15 years ago. But the information, you know, the, think about this. A lot of people are buying beautiful setups and they're buying a lot of really cool gear and they're setting it up with all these cool components and they're running into a lot of issues. And typically someone like myself may come in and say, well, what are all your water parameters? That's the first question I ask. And then I will probably say, stop using this, stop using that, stop using this, let's get back to the basics. So the whole point is you got to know the basics so that you can have a good starting point. And getting the tank back to the basics oftentimes is get rid of this, get rid of that, don't use this, don't install that. And by removing those things from the equation, you simplify the whole system and suddenly the system seems to just start doing better. And you're thinking, but I have all this expensive gear. It's supposed to be state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line, best thing recommended by BRS or Reef Builders or whoever, or even me. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you need it, uh, just because it exists. There's a lot of gear out there that I don't have. <laughs> and I'm, somehow my reef is surviving without it. So it's nice to have stuff, but it's more things to keep an eye on. So I would encourage you to get a really good foundation and you know that's where we talk about becoming more and more mature. Hillbilly Reefer says let's talk about punk pump maintenance. Another good one. So all the pumps in your tank whether they're Vortex, Gyres, Jabo, uh, Tunzi, uh, what else is that? Siki, uh, there's or Siche. There's so many out there that we purchase brand new out of the box, installed in our tank, get it set up just right, program it the way we like it, and then it gets neglected. And one of the things that I don't feel we do often enough, and I, it happens to me as well, is take them out of the tank and clean them. So it's really important that we remove all those power heads that are in the tank that are being bathed with light, that are being you know hit with all the waste and the nutrients and all that kind of stuff where all the algae likes to grow and obscure it and slow the flow and clog up the magnet. Those things need to be cleaned. And by not cleaning them, we end up getting less flow. And so you're paying for the full amount of electricity the pump is pulling, but you're not getting the benefit of it. So you take your pumps apart and clean them. And then the very important pumps that we often forget about is the pump on the side of your protein skimmer, the pump that is inside your return pump area. You have all these parts of your system that are running with gear, and those pumps should not be neglected. 
you need to make sure they're not getting clogged up on the intake. You want to make sure that they're clean on the inside. You want to make sure they're in good, safe condition. They're not leaking electricity in the water. You want to make sure the magnet hasn't split open uh, you know, from swelling. Uh, these are things that you wouldn't know if you don't take the pump apart and clean it. So if you haven't done it, I would say that pumps inside the sump, you know, all that gear that's down in there, or if you're setting up a system that has pumps on the backside, on a hang on back environment, you should take those off at least once a year and clean them, possibly twice. And if you can clean your return pumps once a year or twice a year, and you clean your reactor pumps once or twice a year, you're going to have a lot more longevity and a lot more uh, stability in the system because everything just keeps running in tip-top shape versus if you ignore it. Um, uh, I will mention that a lot of people are really down on white vinegar at this point, which was what we've been using forever to clean stuff. And some are swearing it destroys plastic. I have cleaned so many pumps with white vinegar and I didn't destroy anything. I, I know of one guy in my own local club who put a pump inside a small bucket of vinegar water, or maybe it was just pure vinegar, but I think it was vinegar and water, and set it on his back patio for like three weeks and forgot about it. And when he looked inside it, the entire pump just looked like a rose. It had just peeled open and did this weird thing with all these petals. It was the weirdest thing ever. And he's like, well, don't leave pumps in vinegar forever. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. But I've left pumps in vinegar for a couple of days and not had a problem. Also, one of the things I like to do with cleaning a pump, if you can, if you're able, is take the entire pump and put it inside a vinegar solution and turn it on so it's running inside that solution and moving around. I've also done the same thing using muriatic acid, which uh, cleans much faster than vinegar, but it also can burn your skin, it can get in your eyes, the fumes are bad, you know, it smells awful, uh, it can make you choke. So uh, a lot of people are suggesting citric acid, which you can use as well. And I believe you can buy that locally. I've been buying mine from Amazon just for convenience sake. But citric acid, I believe it was one, oh man, I forgot. I think it's one cup, no, half cup per gallon of water. So I used a couple of cups and a large barrel of water or a large bucket of water and cleaned some gear and it worked really, really well. And there was no smell, my hands didn't burn, it was pretty great. And when I wanted to pour it out, I didn't have to worry I was gonna ruin something like concrete. I could just pour it down the drain of my toilet and all was fine. So I do like citric acid, but I would not tell people don't use white vinegar. If you can get white vinegar, use it, it's just slower. And all white vinegar is, is a weaker acid compared to citric acid or muriatic acid. Uh, Battle 611 says, best way to get metals out like aluminum? Uh, that's a good question, and one person uh, recently had this exact situation in their tank. They did an ICP test, and aluminum was up. And he got a product from two little fishies called Metalzorb, or Metazorb. And when he got it, he was really surprised because, you know, it's kind of like 30 bucks or something. And he said, well, I mean, he described it. I didn't see it. He says, I got this little mesh bag when I open the bag, there's some dust in there, and there's three glass beads. And he says, I think the beads are to make the bag heavy so it sinks down in the sump. And he put it in, and I think he said within 24 hours, the polyps on his SPS started to open up again. And like after 72 hours, this thing was done. It's not designed to stay in your system nonstop. You put it in to absorb aluminum, for example, uh, to absorb some metals that should not be in the system, and then you remove it. And I don't even know if it's something you can recharge and rinse out and reuse. I don't know. But that's something new that came out to the market probably a couple of years ago, but it's been under the radar. And like I said, he was really happy with it. So it's got my interest now. And I've seen it advertised in Coral Magazine. <laughs> I just, I don't have a problem with aluminum or anything like that in my system. When I've done my ICP test, it came back, you know, with the normal numbers. So I haven't had to actually use it. And if I did, I'd need enough for a larger water volume. Then, you know, I'd probably need several, it might cost me a hundred bucks in that product to take care of my size system. But that is one method that should work for you. Um, Alfredo says, talk about ICP tests. That's another great topic that I want to know more about before I do, and what I mean by that is uh, Coral Magazine came out with their article and I haven't read it yet, and I want to be more researched. So I'm going to skip that one and save it for another day, but it definitely is a good one to talk about. Uh, one person said, Coraline Algae. That's a good one, uh, because coralline algae is a thing that most hobbyists want in their aquarium. When they set up their brand new tank and they've got their glass box and their dry sand and their dry rock, they are watching the tank every single day for coralline to appear. And it's because that's usually when you start thinking 
the tank is getting there because the coralline is starting to grow. And it actually kind of goes back to the misnomer that your tank is getting mature now that you're growing coralline. There are some people that can grow coralline very, very quickly from the very beginning. There's others that can go months or years without coralline and don't know why. And normally, the reason coralline is not growing in a tank is because the water parameters are not in the perfect circle. If anything is outside of the circle, just something's off out of range, it just doesn't grow. But when you get everything nice and in a circle, and I know that's a weird reference, it's just how I feel. If everything's inside the circle and it's just perfectly rounded out, all your numbers are where they belong, coralline will appear. And it'll usually appear on plastic first. So you might see spots of it appear on PVC, uh, the PVC fittings inside your tank, like where the elbow comes in. You might see it appear on the lock line. You might see it appear on the overflow box because that's plastic, you know, acrylic. Um, or it may show up on the back of the cleaning magnet, but it may also not show up like on other things like frag racks or such. It just depends what the material is. But it seems to like plastic first before it likes glass or rock. Um, and, you know, it's kind of fun for me in my tank. You know, I, I don't actually think about coralline. I've never had a bad problem with it. There's some people that will say, oh my God, I hate coralline. It's everywhere. I have to keep scraping it off. And you'll see pictures of their tank and there's like this big oval and there's all the coralline around the edges that they don't chip off. I'm like, why aren't you getting all of it? <laughs> and they're like, oh, it's so much work. And I've never had that scenario. Maybe because I stay on top of cleaning my glass on a regular basis. But coralline algae uh, does need alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. It needs the right salinity, it needs the right temperature, it needs the right amount of light. Uh, all those things happen. Coralline will grow in lower light applications more than in bright light applications, but there are guys out there with tanks that have really intense lighting and their rock is just purple with coralline. And I'm not talking about purple rock. I mean, literally, it's covered with coralline. They, they have pictures of the before and then they have the after, and you can totally tell it wasn't like man-made rock that was looking that way. So if you don't have coralline in your tank and you want coralline in your tank, there's a couple of ways to do it. The first one would be to go ahead and take your, get a piece of live rock and put that in your tank to seed the tank so that the coralline goes elsewhere. Another thing you could use is a product like Purple Up from um, Carib Sea. And that one you pour it in and it basically is aragonite milk. <laughs> and it's got magnesium and it's got some other ingredients. And you pour that in your tank a few times and you'll start to see the coralline appear in your system. But if your water parameters are not where they need to be, coralline just doesn't take hold. Uh, it's really important to have magnesium at the right level. It's, it's important that your calcium is in the target range. Alkalinity has to be somewhere between 8 and 11. Um, nitrates and phosphates aren't really a big deal when it comes to affecting coralline, as far as I can tell. I've never seen a tank that had high nitrate that didn't have coralline. You know, it just, that's not the one. It's those other ones that are so important. So the big three are very important, alkaline, calcium, magnesium, and then temperature and salinity. And if you can take care of all of that, then you'll see it. And now once you have coralline anywhere in your tank, scrape it off immediately and you'll chip off those little chips and they will blow around in the tank and land somewhere else. And hopefully they'll land on the rock and start growing on the rock work. That would be the ideal. You may see coralline appear on the side of um, things like clams, it's possible. Uh, of course, it'll get on frag plugs. It could eventually end up on frag racks, depending what they're made of. Some do, some don't. Um, and then eventually you might see stuff like I see, where I have hermit crabs. Their entire shell is just a purple coralline covered shell. You can't even see the shell anymore. And I was looking at a couple of hermits in my anemone cube, and I was like, you can't even see their shell at all. It's completely gone. It's just a purple little guy walking around. It's kind of fun. Uh, Alfredo asked me something I can't even answer. He says, reef aquascaping versus freshwater nature aquariums. I know nothing about freshwater, so I have to skip it. <laughs> um, Narian says, let's talk about achieving SPS color. Color is kind of tricky when it comes to corals because when you buy a brand new little frag, they are bursting with energy and they're full of color. And as they grow into something bigger, a lot of times they're kind of boring looking. I mean, they may look fantastic from above, which means you have to get out your stepladder or get a chair and go up to your tank and remove the canopy or look down from above and look straight down and you'll see the color that you love so much. But from the side of the tank, you may not see the color for a couple of reasons. Number one, the colony itself, you're seeing the side view of it instead of the top view. 
uh, you're getting light shining down from above and you're looking from the side, so it's changing your perspective. And then the glass your aquarium is made of could be uh, standard glass, which has a green tinge to it, which actually takes away some of the look of the coral. Where looking from above, you're looking straight through water only, you get to appreciate the colors. So there's that. There also could be in coming into play if the nutrients are too high in the tank, corals can oftentimes turn brown because the water is not clean enough for them. Uh, and that's the trick because if you're saying, I want colorful softies, well, then you just need to buy a bunch of different color zoanthids. But if you want colorful SPS, those two systems are completely different when it comes to water quality. Zoanthids like dirty water, they like polluted water, they grow where the runoff comes into the ocean. <laughs> it's kind of nutty compared to SPS corals that are so pristine and are getting pounded with flow and getting tons of sunlight. And uh, their, their water's much, much cleaner where they're located in relation to where you find zoanthids in the ocean. Um, and then another thing about colors that would help make something look more colorful in your tank is to mix up the colors so you don't have all the similar colors in one area and similar colors in another area. So if you've got a blue coral, then you want something that's the opposite side of the color wheel near it, like something yellow, so that the blue stands out. If you are not scraping the back of your tank clean, and so let's say you have a really pretty reddish coral, and the background of your tank is all purple from coralline, you're not going to see the reddish coral. But if you scrape off all that coralline so that it's a black background, how I recommend, then that reddish coral will stand out like a gem against a velvet backdrop and it'll really pop with color and you'll see it. I do feel like if you're not even cleaning your glass, your tank will look dull and lifeless. And as soon as you scrape the glass clean and you give the tank about an hour or so to clean up, you'll start to see way more color in your tank. You'll see corals look more high def. And it's really easy to neglect the tank's cleaning. You know, the glass cleaning is something, it's not fun, we don't like doing it. And if you let it go for, let's say a week, you'll kind of have a green sheen and that green will overtake. And then if the glass is standard glass, you got that green plus the green algae and it just, the whole tank looks different. And the same with my anemone cube. When I was scraping the entire back clean, the tank looked great, but when I let it kind of grow with a little bit of green hue to it, the tank looked a little off to me. So it's very important to do that, uh, to keep things clean. Uh, also, if you can, I'd recommend Starfire glass. I always do, it's all I use for all my tanks. I'm very stubborn about it ever since I saw it. The first Starfire tank I ever saw, I believe, was probably 2002. And I was at MACNA here in Fort Worth, and they had this tank, and it was set up, and it just looked like there was no water in it. There was like 50 clownfish swimming back and forth, and that water was pristine. And I was just like, how did they do this? And they said, it's the glass. And I was like, what? And they said, that's called Starfire. I'm like, what a dumb name. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's amazing glass. It's a uh, low iron. It doesn't have the green hue. It's a clear glass and it will make everything pop that's inside your tank. So it, I would recommend going with Starfire glass. Uh, Ethan says, when is it appropriate to start weaning off of the water changes? Well, you're talking to a guy that very, very rarely does water changes. So I don't know if it's about weaning or more like I don't want to do it and you know, because we become lazy and, and uh, What's the other word I'm looking for? Ap apathetic? I think that's what I'm looking for. Um, and so if your tank is getting everything it needs and it's receiving, you know, like you're dosing all the additional elements that are being consumed by the livestock and the livestock's doing well, you may discover that you could lean away from doing water changes. Um, I'm actually at the point now, I'm, I'm, I've been talking about this for, I don't know, two years. I'm frustrated with my nitrates again, and I think I'm at the point now where I'm going to do 50 gallon water changes once a week, <laughs> which is crazy. But I'm thinking about doing that. I have my big vat in the back full of salt water right now, and there's probably three water changes in there. And I think I'd like to do that and try to just clean it up. And so that's my plan to do that. And uh, I'm going to see if that helps get these nitrates down because nothing seems to work. Nothing is working that I've tried. Every kind of solution out there that has been suggested has not worked out. By the way, that's my shadow going by. Uh, so anyway, specifically, if the livestock is doing well, I, here's the thing. Some people say, well, I dose everything my tank needs and my water quality is perfect. Why would I want to change anything and change the water? And... 
there are companies out there that have been really promoting, you know, like Triton has been recommending a water change list system. And you do ICP testing every three months, and you, based on those tests, you would use A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, or whatever it is that, you know, they, they label their jars with. And you would have to use X amount of these things. Based on the test, they'd say you need this much barium, you need this much uh, manganese, you need this much, you know, whatever. And they'll tell you what to dose for the, until the next ICP test. And the idea is to level everything out perfectly so that your tank can be an enclosed ecosystem without changing water. Um, for newer hobbyists, water changes are your best, usually your cheapest solution to any problem. You know, every other product you look at on the market, every gizmo you can buy costs more than the water change. And a water change you can usually perform. And, you know, like there was someone who recently posted, I've got this problem in my tank and I wish I could solve it. And, and then, you know, he, we found out he has a 16 gallon tank. 16 gallons is nothing. I mean, it literally is such a small body, body of water. Doing an 8 or 10 gallon water change would probably solve 90% of whatever's wrong in that tank, you know, in like one or two water changes. So the bigger the tank, like in my tank, 450 gallons, changing 225 gallons of water at once is just, I don't want to do it. But if I did 50 a week, that's 200 a month. That's almost half the water in my tank. So that's probably a good way to go. And so what I want to do is I want to clean up my French drain that's been set up now for 10 years. I want to pop off the covers. When I put them in, I put them in and put the concrete around it so that they would never move. Because I was always worried if I was in there on a step ladder or a step stool or anything like that, or just, I don't know, anything on there, if it popped out and I fell, I got hurt, that would suck. So I embedded those, those grates in the concrete and I'm going to now pry them off and clean out the drain so it's a nice clean piece of PVC again. And then I probably will use silicone and silicone those back into place. That's what I'm hoping will work. I haven't tried it yet. I'm a little nervous. But I want to do that because I want to do my, I want to drain the water into that drain. And so my plan is to drain via that drain that I set up so long ago. But it's been used so many times, it's just getting clogged up with sediment. I need to clean it all out. And once I've done that, then I can do my weekly water changes and I am ready to start. So to back to your question, you know, about weaning off, the, really the question is why are you doing it? What is the upside? What is the, uh, the need behind not doing it? Are you just trying to do like someone else or are you, you know, I'm just kind of trying to see where your viewpoint is coming on it. Myself, I've gone a long time without them. My tank has done well. I mean, you can see video here. Corals are happy. But um, would they be happier with lots of water changes? We'll see. <laughs> Um, okay. Tammy says, how about, uh, safely handling corals? I haven't, uh, I haven't, still haven't put one in my tank yet. I just added a story blending yesterday with my two clowns. Congratulations. Um, corals on the most part you can handle with your hands. Now, if you are a little nervous about it, you could uh, use rubber gloves. Um, when the vet was here, she was seeing, you know, she told me why I can't leave here without telling you, you should wear gloves when you're working in your tank. And I was like, where were you 22 years ago? <laughs> so, I mean, there is the chance of getting something, you know, occasionally someone will get sick from a, uh, inf you know, from some kind of bacteria in the water. And it can affect certain people sometimes. Myself, when it comes to handling anything in my tank, I rinse my hands first before I put my hands in the tank. I work in the tank. I go rinse my hands again. I dry them off. And uh, I, if I have to rinse my hands 15 times during the process, I will do that. I, I, I do it all the time. It's just what I do. When it comes to handling corals, I try not to handle them a lot. So you unbag them. They've been acclimated. Then I would take it and I'd put it in a bowl in a coral dip to kill any kind of uh, parasites. By the way, someone else, you know, can frag dips kill dinoflagellates? Um, if you see a coral covered in dinoflagellates, do not put it inside your system. Uh, but anyway, back to this. So you dip your coral, then you remove it from the, the dip, and you rinse it in tank water, and then you finally put it in your tank or inside your frag system or wherever it's going to go. Um, I try to keep my hands off of it after that point. I don't want to next glue it in my tank or putty it into place because it just got stressed. I handled it, I dipped it, I rinsed it, I blew it off with a turkey baster, and now I'm going to push putty against it. It's just too many things happening at once. So instead, I like to take the frag, and I like to press it down in the sand, you know, in its little frag plug, and hopefully nothing will knock it over or bury it. But I just leave it alone for a couple of weeks, and then, after it's gotten used to my tank, then I can go ahead and place it where I like it in my tank, 
and using super glue gel or some kind of a two-part putty to secure it in place. Um, if it were to get bumped over, I'll stand it up again with like a, a, an acrylic rod, you know, a stick. Uh, you could use a, uh, a glass scraper, whatever handy tool you have, or some tongs. Just keeping your hands off it, keep the oils from your skin off of it, and just leave it be because I feel like we handle it too much and it might just finally say, I give up, I'll just die. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. We don't want our stuff to die. So that's basically how I recommend it. Now, some rule of thumb when it comes to handling corals, and let's say you like zoanthids, for example, and you're like, they're pretty and they're affordable. Well, you should wear eye protection and you should keep your mouth shut when you're handling them. You don't want any of their juice that squirts out to go into your mouth. You don't want to get any palytoxin on your hands and then rub your face or itch your eye or anything like that. If you have any open cuts, it's another good reason to wear rubber gloves over your hands. Uh, I really like the disposable ones. You put them on once, you throw them away. And uh, there are some that are lined with a powder, and then there's others that aren't. I don't actively go looking specifically for a certain brand. I have found gloves at Harbor Freight. I found gloves um, in other stores. I just used some, and they were fine. They're very temporary. And if I'm, like, when I was doing that big project, when Dwayne and I pulled a lot of corals out of my tank, I pulled out... Um, some gloves for everyone, and as we worked, we would just replace our gloves and put another one on because they were getting torn. So, you know, stay on top of it. And as you're working in the tank, the water may go in your gloves, and when that happens, you know, you're, if you have an open cut, the open cut is now getting, you know, uh, saturated inside the glove. So, you know, quickly remove the glove, you know, dry your hand off, and maybe reset, or Better yet, don't work in your tank while you have any open cuts on your fingers for a few days. Let them seal up again before you put them in salt water. Those are some of the thoughts that come to mind. Um, Gary Brown says, we should discuss how to keep your system stable. Uh, the number one way of keeping a tank stable is automation. And I have been a big proponent of the Apex controller for a long time. I used it when it was called the Aqua controller. Um, way back in the uh, early 2000s, and over the years it has changed until now it's called Apex. And the Aqua controller tracks a lot of stuff and turns things on and off, but there's also gear that we can use that takes care of things automatically around the clock. For example, a protein skimmer. And having a protein skimmer on your tank running 24 hours a day is hugely beneficial because it is catching and trapping all the particulates in the water and exporting them into the collection cup. And it's also driving off the CO2 in the water, which allows pH to stay up and not depress too low. And especially this time of year, as it gets hotter and hotter, we keep our houses closed up, we have the AC on, there's no fresh air getting in, and your, uh, your pH could be a little lower. A protein skimmer helps combat that and keep the pH within a good range. Um, and uh, just since I'm talking about pH, I just want to mention, if your tank is 7.7 .7 at you know, in the morning to 7.9 at night, that is still okay. I know a lot of people like 8.3. Uh, that's like the magic number. But if you're 7.7 .7 to 7.9 every day, every single day, and your corals are okay, and your fish are okay, then that's fine. If your tank is 7.9 to 8.1 every single day, that's fine. If your tank's 8.1 to 8.3 every day, that's fine. These are all good numbers, 8.0 to 8.2. Usually you're going to have a 0.2 swing in pH daily. That's what you can expect, and that would be a very stable system. And trying to force the tank to be 8.3 every single day by pouring something in, whether it be caulk washer or a pH buffer or something like that, you're going to actually affect and elevate the alkalinity higher and higher and higher, which is detrimental to your tank. So we don't want to do that. We want to keep things where they belong, and we want them to be stable day to day. And so, you know, someone, I don't remember who it was, but it was a long time ago, someone said, you know, SPS stands for stability promotes success. And I thought, oh, that's pretty clever. You know, because when we think SPS, we think small polyp stony, uh, which are the corals that are in this video right there. <laughs> I'm always going to point to the wrong direction. Um, Stability would be stable temperature, uh, your temperature range being somewhere maybe a swing of one to two degrees a day. Salinity, always the same, day in, day out, before and after water change, same salinity, that's stable. Alkalinity, if it's being dosed manually, or if it's being trickled in with a doser, or it's being added via a calcium reactor, or it's being replenished via Kalkwasser additions uh, via automation, uh, uh, through evaporation and top-off. These are the things that we look for when a 
when we're trying to keep stability in the tank. But the biggest way to keep stability in your tank is to do weekly water testing. And if you're not testing your water weekly, you're uh, doing your tank a disservice. And so that's why every single week on the live stream I tell you today is water test Saturday and you're supposed to test your water. And more and more of you are doing it, I'm proud of you, and I want you to keep up the good work. Uh, Pickle Boy says I'm, uh, he actually was asking about the Apex. He's going to be setting up a 65 gallon tank soon and wanted to know if that tank would do well with an Apex. The Apex itself will be good with any tank. And I saw a guy with a beautiful little tank that I filmed last year. I think the tank was uh, 15 gallons. <laughs> and he had the full Apex setup underneath. It was fantastic. That's why I filmed it. And it's just really incredible all the gear that went on that tank. Some people might think, well, you need one when your tank's 120 gallons or bigger. But really, any size tank can benefit from the automation that the Apex can do. Because not only does it turn things on and off, it's also notifying you when things are wrong. And that's really important. So I would definitely say if it's in your wheelhouse to buy one, I would do it. They have, the, they have three different versions at this point. BRS was selling one type that was very cheap, but it was monitor only. So it couldn't do anything, but it could just read things, you know. Um, then there's the $500 kit that has a, a couple of probes in there, and it's got the energy bar, and it's got the brain. And then they've got the full kit, which is $800. That's the one I use on my own tank, and that's the one that I would recommend to anyone because it has four different probes in it. It's got the energy bar. It's got the brain. Um, and it, it works with Wi-Fi. You know, it does a lot of nice things. And uh, if you choose to buy the $500 one because it's less expensive and then you want all the things the $800 one came with, that larger Apex ends up, to get it to match the larger one, you end up spending more buying the extra parts to get it to that point. So in other words, the $500 plus all the stuff, you end up spending something like $900. But if you just buy the $800, you get it all in the same box and you're done. So I really like it. I wouldn't want to run a tank without it. it just It's such peace of mind to just just peace of mind to just glance over at the tank or open your phone and look on there or look on your computer and you can see the tank temperature, you can see the pH, you can see uh, what things are turned on, what things are turned off. You can look at data over time and see how the tank's temperature goes up and down. You can see how the alkalinity has been going up. You can track all your test kit results in there if you wanted. There are no keeping in there. I don't do any of that, but those are all built in for you to use and people are using Alexa to control it to turn things on and off, which is kind of cool as well. Uh, I find that the Apex is a really, really good tool to let you know what's going on. And it allows me to do extra things like turn things off. Like I did a stream a few weeks ago about a waste collector on my protein skimmer. And when the protein skimmer had dumped enough solution into the waste collector that it was full, a float switch, float switch would rise and it would then turn off the protein skimmer because the Apex said that container's full. I need to turn off this machine. And I felt that that was a fantastic addition to my system years ago, and my only regret was that I didn't do it sooner. Uh, Jeremy says, I just sent out my first ICP test trying to figure out why all my Montes shed their skin within a month. Um, you didn't say how old your tank was, you didn't say what your water parameters were. Um, doing an ICP test may give you some answers, it's possible. Um, it could be something else is going on in your system, even a fish nibbling on them, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So years ago, I was at a fish store not far from me, and I went in and he had a, they called it a German blue polyp montipora. It was beautiful. So it basically was like a pale beige or yellow skin, but it had these blue polyps, like, oh my God, I want that. And so I came home, I dipped it, and I glued it in my tank, done. And the next day, the thing was dead. And I was like, well, that was a rip off. They gave me a bad coral. <laughs> So I went up to the store and complained. And he's like, you know, we don't warranty corals. Like, one day? Are you kidding me? Literally, it died. Everything in my tank's alive, but this brand new coral, it's dead. And he just said, like, what do you want me to do? It's like, I want you to give me another one for free. And, you know, because I was really adamant and upset. And uh, so he gave me another one. He wasn't happy. And he says, I'm not doing this again. I was like, all right, fine. I just feel like you gave me a bad one. So... <laughs> I really didn't know anything back then. So I dipped it and I put it in my tank and I put it in, in, in you know, the same spot with a little bit of glue. And then you know, that evening, I'm sitting in my chair across the room from the aquarium and I'm looking at the tank 
and I watched my flame angel just swim up and just go pow, pow, pow. And he was eating each polyp right off the stick. I was like, oh, that wasn't the fish store at all. That wasn't a bad coral at all. That wasn't anything. My flame angel eats that coral. Never mind my mistake. So the point of the story is check your fish and see if there's something going on. Um, but like you said, they're shedding their skin. Montipora isn't really a shedder <laughs> of any kind, but what it does do is it can RTN or, or it can STN. Uh, RTN is quick, uh, where it just, the skin is peeling off. Matter of fact, I have a picture of some RTN on an acro in my tank that happened uh, a few weeks ago. And I just watched it go up a, an entire branch and just kill the whole thing. And that was it. But all the rest of the corals in the tank were fine. So I just let it happen and I cut out what died. But I do hope you figure out what's happening in your tank. Michael Wells says, we should talk about how to protect your investment. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. And uh, I can't overemphasize the, the need for you to have backups of everything. Um, a long time ago, I had my 280-gallon reef going. I, that tank ran from 2004 to 2010. And it was a beautiful reef tank. And there was at least 10 times during those six years where I thought, I should buy another 280-gallon tank and just put it in the back room so when this one fails, I can just put everything in the new tank and go on with my life. And I kept saying to myself, that's crazy talk. Who does that? That is insane. I'm not going to do that. And then literally like a couple of days before it hit its six-year anniversary, the tank sprung a leak. And guess who wished he had a backup 280-gallon tank at that point? But no, uh, most people are not going to buy an extra aquarium to have ready. But having extra pumps, having extra nets, having extra heaters, having extra air pumps with air stones, having a generator, um, having the ability to swap out pumps in your tank. You know, I said extra pumps, but I'm being specific now. Uh, if you have vortex, having one extra vortex on the shelf or an extra gyre or an extra wave or an extra CHA or whatever it is pump you like to use, having one more is great because you can rotate it. You can put the clean one in the tank, take the dirty one out, let it you know soak. And then when it's clean, you can put it in the tank and take the next dirty one out and you can basically cycle through and have one clean one ready on the shelf. So that if one does break or burn up or something bad happens at some point, you can just take out the bad one, put in the backup, keep the flow in your tank going so your livestock is safe. Same goes for return pumps. Um, I know BRS right now is promoting buying two return pumps for your system and putting two pumps in the sump. And I don't think you need that. I think you need to own two of them and have one in the sump and have one on the shelf. And that way, when you want to take one out for cleaning, you could put the other one on. Or you can just keep the brand new one in the box for whenever that one has a problem. You have the choice to either strip parts from the extra one and get that one going, you know, the one that failed. Or you can just take the bad one out, put the new one in, life is good, order another new one, put it on the shelf. But even my own tank, I have a big, huge, beefy external return pump wrapped up, ready to go, sitting in the back room for if and when the abyss pump goes out. But for now... I mean, I have a pump in my system that has a 10-year warranty that I shouldn't have any issue whatsoever with, and I'm, you know, I'm not sweating it, but I thought, still, if it does break and I have to mail it in, it could take a week or two or three to get it repaired. What am I going to do for three weeks? So I bought an extra pump, ready to go, and it'll require me to drill a hole in my sump, install a bulkhead, hook up some plumbing, and boom, I've got f water flowing back up into my tank. And that can be done in a matter of an hour. So that is how I feel it should be, and I feel all of you should do it, and you should never neglect having an extra pump. Uh, your extra pump could be something useful, though. It doesn't have to necessarily be something on a shelf in a closet. What if, for example, your return pump was a mag pump, like a mag 9.5? Then you buy a second mag 9.5, and you use it to mix your salt water and to pump water in the tank and pump water out of the tank for water changes, and then you put it away. And if your return pump dies, you've got your water change pump that you can now use as a return pump, and you can order a new water change pump. So you see, having an extra is so important. Having enough salt on hand is so important. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've read people say, my tanks have this problem, but I'm out of salt. I'm like, how do you ever run out of salt? <laughs> it's the basic ingredient of a salt water tank. So we definitely want to have salt on hand. You want your test kits to be up to date, so you know you want to stay on top of that and make sure you're replacing them in a timely fashion. They usually last about a year. These are all part of protecting your investment. And if you're not keeping all these things and staying in touch with everything and, and maintaining and watching and checking and cleaning, your investment will go into the toilet and you'll lose all your investment. So we want to definitely 
take good care of what we have. And one thing I, I've been harping on for a long time is clean everything. Clean the top rim of your tank, clean the top rim of your sump. You know, wipe everything down so you can see what's actually happening in the system. Clean the front, clean the back, clean the sides. You know, get down in the nitty gritty and see if there's anything amiss. Take a look inside your flow uh, accelerators and see if they're clogging up. Look inside your, any plumbing parts that you can look inside, see if there's anything in there that doesn't belong. I discovered, and this is completely unrelated, but I just saw it because I would look at things. I had a cucumber this big in my sump yesterday. I was like, what are you doing over here? So I put him in the review gym. So now he has a new place to live. But I have no idea how he even got there. But somehow he did. Um, Hillbilly Reefer suggested another topic we can discuss, how to get good pictures. Well, let's just pretend we're only talking about cell phones because that's what most people are wanting to do. The first thing I would recommend is you have some kind of a clip that you can put on your phone to filter out the blue. The other thing you could do, which is like right now you're looking at my tank, right there. <laughs> I'm going to continue pointing to the wrong direction. Um, that's 10K lighting. There, a lot of you have LED lights in your tank that let you switch to white light. Turn on the white lights and take your picture. It does not have to be blue for the picture. You have the ability with an app to change the color instantaneously and take your picture and then you can switch it back to blue when you're done. And for those that, you know, send me pictures of blue stuff that I can't see anything, I just tell them, take me another picture with a flashlight, with the flash, um, with daylight, anything you can to get rid of the blue because the blue hides everything and we can't see what the problem is. Uh, I had a person just this week say, I have black bugs in my tank and what do I do about them? And I said, I've never had to fight black bugs, so I don't have any advice. And the next day he says, they're red bugs. <laughs> because <laughs> he looked at them with white light and he discovered they were red bugs and I had an article about that and he had a solution so he was happy. But if you are trying to take pictures of your tank, the first thing you want to do is get good lighting or you want to have a good filter to filter out the blue. And then I would love to just take the camera, the phone and just put it up on the tank. So we'll just do it right now. I don't think you'll see much but I like to put the phone right on the glass so it can't move and I touch it to adjust the balance so that the, it's not too bright or dim and then I touch the button, Spock, get out of the way. So I focus, you can even focus lock on the iPhone and then you can pull down the brightness a little bit to make it a little darker and then you take your picture and now we've got a photograph. And if you would do that type of photography instead of standing back and shooting from a distance, you'll end up with a pretty good shot. So let's do this now. So here is the picture that I just took, let's see, how do I get this? I'm looking for it. Is it gonna pivot? <laughs> okay, so here's the picture I just took. And all I did was keep the phone on the glass. And by keeping it on the glass, there's no shake, there's no shutter. It's gonna be a nice crisp shot and everything's in focus. And that's what we want. And if you do that, you will end up having some really nice pictures. So. <clears throat> All right. Oh, look, it's just me now. No more movie. Um, I like the movie in the background. All right, go back to what we had. So those are the first steps I have. The second thing I want to tell you, and I did a live stream about this with uh, Reef Dudes that you could watch if you want. It's a full length uh, discussion. The other thing you can do is you can take the picture again, because <laughs> that's that cell phone. You can take the picture 15 times until you get it right. There's no reason to say, I took the shot, help me everyone, and it's blurry and garbage. Like, why would you ever upload that? You even looking at, know it's a bad picture. Like, I know it's a bad picture. I'm like, then why did you send it? So take it over and over till you get the right one. Throw away the bad pictures, because you can, because it's a cell phone. And now you've got one good shot. You also have the ability inside your phone to edit the picture and make it look even better. You can enhance it. You can uh, use the magic uh, wand and just boom, it does auto clean up. Or you can adjust contrast, you can adjust darkness, you can adjust uh, saturation if you wanted. Uh, you know, I don't usually touch saturation, but some people do. And you can make the picture look even better. You can crop it to what matters. Oh, the other thing I don't like to do when it comes to photography, I don't like to zoom and then take the picture. I like to take the full picture. It's like a 12 megapixel picture in my phone, or maybe it's bigger these days. And then that ginormous picture, I can then crop into the thing I want to show you guys. And I will cut and save that, and it'll actually look really good because there's so much data. But if you zoom in and take a picture, 
it could look really pixelated because it's using the mechanical zoom and so, or what is that called? Optical zoom? Uh, it's doing computations to zoom in rather than literally changing a lens to get that zoomed in focus. So just take the full shot and then crop down to what you're trying to share. Um, and you, nowadays you even have markup in your phone. You can put an arrow at the thing or a circle around the thing you're talking about and you can say this is what I want to know about. But that these are all things I'm talking about you're asking a question. If you're just trying to take nice pictures uh, some other things you want to do is turn off all the lights in the room so it's pitch dark so there's no reflections. Um, I like to, some people like to turn off all the flow in the tank so there's zero water movement and that way the polyps are just out and they're not moving you can take the shot. Those are, that's something that you could do. I tend to leave my flow turned on but you can turn it off. Um, don't feed the tank uh, right before you're taking pictures because you have particulates blowing everywhere and clean the glass the day before. Don't clean the glass the day you're going to take pictures. Clean it the day before, the night before and clean it all the way down to the substrate. Get every little bit of that off because a lot of times the cool activity is happening down on the sand and you try and take a picture and there's all this crap on the glass that's one inch above the sand and you cannot see your little hermit crabs duking it out for who's going to be king of the mountain for example. So these are some of the tips, you know, having clean glass inside and out. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. If you're using a DSLR, that's a little different. Um, if you're going to do that, then you can shoot in RAW, R-A-W, and that is the most data you can get with a picture, and then you can clean it up in Lightroom and Photoshop. I have uh, a Lightroom tutorial here on this channel you could watch, and I show how I adjust pictures to make them look true to life. So you could do that. Um, and some like to use a remote flash. So they have a flash that you know they got their DSLR and then they have the flash that normally you clip it on the top but you take it off and you have this long uh, curly cue cord so you can hold it over the tank and shoot at an angle as you've got the camera uh, focusing forward and when you're doing that here's your flash shooting down and you're clicking from here and you end up getting this really well lit subject and that works really well especially with fish um, and then also if you're trying to take pictures of fish here's a cool little thing that people don't think about they're so worried that the fish be in focus Turns out the only thing you need in focus when you're taking a picture of a fish is the eye. Because if the eye is blurry, the picture's ruined. So as long as the eye is in focus on a fish, people are like, ooh, that's a great looking fish. You, trust me, prove me wrong in that one. <laughs> it happens all the time. You post a picture with a great looking eye and they love the fish. It's, it's the weirdest thing ever. We are very picky about eyes. So those are some tips. Um, Mitch says, what is the lifespan of an acrylic tank? What conditions can affect its lifespan? Light, heat, humidity. Uh, none of those things actually hurt the acrylic as much as sunlight. So keeping an aquarium out of sunlight as much as possible, like don't have it on the back patio, don't uh, have it sitting out in the yard, that kind of, and then plan to reuse it one day, um, that just doesn't work out. And uh, other than that, Acrylic tanks are kind of forever tanks, other than they scratch up really easily. And you can polish it out, but it's a big effort. Basically, the tank has to be drained. You have to hire someone that's a professional that will then polish it and make it, like, brand new again. And, you know, it costs you whatever it costs you, $500, $1,000. But if your tank costs you several thousand and you're paying, I don't know, let's say you paid a thousand to make it brand new again, still have a brand new tank. <laughs> so there's that benefit. But... Uh, for the most part, they they really are they hold up really well long term. They can go a super long time. What makes them do badly is the scratches, um, allowing things like coralline algae to grow on them, and then when you try and chip it off, you end up with these weird opaque, smoky areas that again could be polished out, but it has to be done by a professional. There's no easy, simple in tank solution with the reef still running, so there's that downside. But other than that, no, I can't. And of course, this foundation that the tank is sitting on has to be level and sturdy and fully support the tank. That one's very important. You can't just worry about supporting the edges on an acrylic tank. The entire tank, the whole base, has to be evenly supported so that there is no give and no bow. You don't want the bottom of the tank bubbling or pulling at the seams. You want it super sturdy. Um, quick question from PPSTHLM, who I really think we need to buy you a vowel. Um, he said, did you put all your anemones in the tank at the same time? When I set up the tank, I put in probably four. And uh, over time, it has grown to as many as you see now. 
Uh, Jamie says, I'm wondering how long it takes to really get a reef to start growing serious growth and if there's anything that will really boost the tank growth rate to get past the tank of frags. Ooh, good question. So usually what happens is, like I said when the tank, or said earlier, when the tank hits maturity, things start to settle in. It, it, you're getting more mature as a hobbyist and you've dialed in all of your gear to work exactly the way you, you're supposed to. It's dosing the right amount on a regular basis. Week after week, your test kits are always showing you the same numbers. You're doing good. At that point, your corals just start to take off. Now, you may have a couple of corals that are stubborn and just sit there and do nothing forever. I had a couple in this tank behind me that uh, did nothing forever and finally died. And I was like, fine, I'm happy. You're gone because you wouldn't do anything. But the majority of the corals in my tank grow and become bigger and bigger, and I have to trim them. So it, it's not really a matter of getting all of them to do it at the same time. You know, it, it's hard to make everything work perfectly at the same time in a reef tank. And I've said in the past, and I haven't really felt this way in a while, it's kind of nice. Um, I've said in the past that usually there's only like three weeks out of the year that I like my tank. And then the rest of the year I'm kind of ang angry at it because something's not right. But my tank's been really stable for some time now. And uh, I just put stuff in and it just, for the most part, does well. I, like I said, I had this one little nub that I got like two years ago and it sat on a frag plug and finally it put out a little bit of skin on the frag plug and nothing, it just sat there. I've got a Walt Disney in the back of my tank that's just a green thing, does nothing. And if it died, I wouldn't even care because it did nothing. It just, and I've had it two years and it just refuses to do anything and I don't know why. But uh, I've got other corals like the Shadow Caster that are big and huge and you know, the Drew's Acro and I've got Lime in the Sky, I've got Monopore, I've got scroll, you know, Scrolling Corals and Gargonians over here that are Hammer Corals and Duncans. And I mean, there's tons of stuff in there, lots and lots of beautiful life. And everything grew from small things. I didn't start this tank with uh, microscopic frags. I, what I did was I had frags I started with initially. Like Drew's Acro was a little frag. And it was like this big and then it grew sideways and up and then sideways and kind of did this long thing kind of looked like a lightning bolt like what are you doing and it was lying in the sand in my temporary 250 gallon tank 215 gallon tank when the 400 leaked and it just sat there and i i threw it on a rock and it started growing and it turned into something decent finally after all this weight and then when i set up the 400 i moved that chunk and put it in the tank and now i have this massive colony that's actually two tiers right here in the middle of my tank. Um, there's one tier here and then there's one beneath it. That's all Drew's Acro. And that coral is, I mean, it's easily dinner plate size, if not bigger. And it all started from a single frag. But when you're transferring livestock from one tank to the next, you're kind of starting with bigger stuff. And to be honest, it's actually harder because when you have larger corals going into a tank, and the reason they were large because I'd been growing them in a temporary tank and they were waiting for the new tank and the new tank took so long to get here that when it finally was here I had big stuff to put in which is kind of annoying because now when you're trying to put them in place they they take up so much real estate versus you set up a tank and you put in a lot of little frags there's all that space around everything and you're thinking this is great they're going to grow in nicely and now you're waiting for the growth so again stability maturity these are the things that are going to lead toward a good flow good light um, that stable temperature year round is really important and uh, keeping things happy that usually is all it takes, and then nature just takes care of itself. You know, it shouldn't be something else you have to do magically. Uh, there are people out there that totally believe in certain recipes, you know, where you're putting in one drop of this and four drops of that, and you're, you're, you're doing something, um, you know, like, a, like a mad scientist, you know. And that Some people live for that. They love that. Others are more inclined to just set it up and let it do its thing at whatever pace it likes. And then others are like me, we kind of are in the middle between those two, and we, we want some of this and some of that, but not too much work. Hey, thanks. Patrick says, I love how Reef Trace app gives me a notification that you're live. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There's actually a human being that types that in and hits send and it goes out to the world. It's not completely automated. It's kind of cool, I like that. Uh, one person asked me to talk about UV, but I really have nothing to say about it. Other than if you're going to use it, I'd use it on a quarantine tank, or I'd use it on a tank that's dealing with an algae bloom. But I don't have much more information to say about it. Uh, Dave says, when, why, and what size humidifier, dehumidifier should I get? I live in Florida, and it's warm and humid all year long. Um, I have one that I believe is 32 cups. 
and I don't know why they measure in cups. <laughs> why don't they just say it holds three and a quarter gallons or whatever the number is? Um, I've had it for years. Um, it was the biggest one I could find at Home Depot and I drain it every single day. And it's in the summer, I could drain it twice a day if I let it run 24 hours a day. In the winter, it might take a couple of weeks to fill up, which is kind of interesting. I don't know why that is. Um, I guess our summers are more humid. But uh, I run mine every single night. I usually turn it on around something like 1 in the morning. And it runs until about 11 a.m. And if it's full, it just turns itself off. And um, if it's not full yet, it'll keep running until it turns itself off, or I will turn it off. Because the problem with a dehumidifier running in the room where you are you got sound and you got heat coming off the back and the heat is filling up your room. So you're pulling humidity out of the air and you're pumping heat into the air. So your AC has to fight the heat and your tank is giving off more humidity <laughs> and you got humidity from outside. It's this vicious cycle. But anyway, I've been running dehumidifier for a while. It's definitely helped my house not rot away as quickly as it was. Um, my refrigerator was rusting in its stainless steel, which shouldn't rust, but does. And by the way, is not covered under warranty, which is ridiculous. Um, the vents on my ceiling were rusting, you know, there's just things were rotting. So I've been running it to help keep things from getting destroyed. And, uh, you know, if you should run it as soon as you can, I wouldn't wait. I would do it now because I've noticed that when humidity is lower inside the home, the air conditioning doesn't feel cold and clammy. I remember, uh, I was talking to my tank sitter who also is an AC guy and he said, I said, man, I'm freezing. You know, I got the AC running, but it's summer and I'm just freezing here. He goes, you need to run your dehumidifier. And so I did and I felt better. It was weird, um, but he was right. <laughs> so I would recommend it, definitely. Um, Majuf says, what does YPAT mean? That was you pick a topic. And I just thunk it up today. <laughs> Patrick, I am so sorry to hear that you caught the COVID. Um, he says that it sucks being trapped in a 13 by 13 foot room. And he says he was glad that I'm live. And he says his little 40 gallon reef tank will never be cleaner than it is now because of him having to tend to it every single day. Yeah, it's never been cleaner than now. Yeah. Well, Soon you'll get out of your room and you'll be okay to be out in public again. But yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. It's happening to other people too. You're not the only one. Hey, Cindy, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. That's weird. It says, uh, his arm it should be her arm, her thumbs up. I will talk with you later, Cindy, and find out what that's about. I feel like I'm missing something. Um, one person said, let's talk about not using a skimmer and only using a refugium. Uh, well, I don't recommend it. I would much rather you have a protein skimmer than a refugium. But if you want a refugium, have a refugium. But that protein skimmer is so important to your system. And I definitely recommend it. Um, it's, it's does so much for your tank around the clock that you're not doing. That, uh, you know, it's like this giant safety net that I completely rely upon. I just won't run a tank without a protein skimmer. I can't even imagine doing it. So the refugium is nice, but unless you had same monster refugium and you had, you know, a small little display tank, that might help with a lot of natural filtration. You know, let's just say you had like a 55 gallon refugium with mangroves growing out of the top and you had a 10 gallon display tank with a frogfish. <laughs> that would be awesome, right? Um, that could work. But most people have a big tank and they have room for a smallish refugium underneath and it's just not big enough to really make a huge impact on the tank. Even my refugium, I don't think it's that big. I mean, I guess it's big, but I don't find it to be so big that I could say that would handle my filtration. And by the way, it's doing really well. Um, it's very green. It had a big cyano problem in there that was bothering me and that's all pretty much gone, which is nice. And now I'm finding a whole bunch of the uh, cyano inside my turf scrubber, which is weird. Oh, by the way, the turf scrubber I have is the big giant one. There is a smaller version available on BRS right now that's uh, 
that's less expensive. Um, I think it was rated for 120 gallon tanks or 120 and up. Um, or mine's probably for like a 500 gallon system. Just found out about that last night. I knew it was in the works, but I didn't know that it was actually available. So they are on BRS. It's from Four Square Aquatics. And I like it because it's like a file cabinet with a drawer you pull out to clean out the sheet, and then you push the drawer back in, and it becomes nice and quiet. Ah, yes, uh, that is true. Uh, Gary was just saying how he's spent a lot of time learning on YouTube. You know, um, I feel like YouTube can be very educational with, uh, depending on the speaker, uh, depending on who's presenting and how they're presenting. And there are a lot of channels out there. There's a lot of different personalities out there. I mean, I've got my own personality and not everyone loves it. Um, but the, the uh, content has to be believable, it has to make sense, it has to be clear and concise. <laughs> I'm, I'm not concise, that's for sure. If I'm doing these rambling streams for hours, I'm not concise. Concise would be me talking about something for seven minutes and we're done. And you guys know, I have not been good about doing edited videos in some time. I, it's on my, my wish list of things to do, but business has been so brisk for me this year that uh, I've just not had any time at all to sit down and edit. I, I just don't. Uh, last night I built a whole bunch of acrylic stuff because I've got a bunch of people waiting on orders right now. And I've got more to do this weekend and i got more to do next week. I'm just going to keep cranking them out and keep everyone happy. I appreciate all the people that are buying things from me. I need to stick this on the screen really quick. This is the perfect time to mention it. So if you're buying things from Milo's Reef, you are supporting this channel. You're supporting me and you're feeding Spock. And I really appreciate that you guys are choosing to buy from me. I'll tell you, I had someone reach out to me yesterday with an email. No, two days ago. And he said, Mark, I've been watching your channel religiously. I watch it every single week. And I want to buy the Abyss 200 pump, the A200. It's a very expensive pump. And he said, I know I could buy it somewhere else, but I want to support you and your channel, what you do. And I'd rather you have the money than a big company. And I was, you know, really touched. And so I called him up. And he was like, I'm talking to the guy I listen to on YouTube every week. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's me. And uh, so anyway, I took his order. I placed it. It's going to happen. And it was really nice that he chose to do that because I know you guys have a lot of choices. And I know sometimes um, you can find things somewhere else that would be less because there's no shipping uh, fee. But, you know, my company can't afford to just give away free shipping. It's just not an option. So I do appreciate when you guys buy things from me. It definitely uh, is fantastic. And... Uh, I feel a lot of times that all my customers are literally my YouTube audience. And so when I think of, you know, anything I'm talking about, I feel like, well, I talked about on YouTube. That's why people are buying it. Where maybe they're just buying it because they found it on Google. I don't know. But I tend to think all the customers are from, the, from here. <laughs> I, I don't know why I think that. It's weird, right? But, uh, and also... I always want to reiterate, and I think a lot of you have come to, they just know it now, but I just like to repeat it for people that don't know. Uh, the website charges a lot for shipping, and if there's less, if there's a way to ship it for less, I will ship it for less, and I send you a refund of the difference. So I'm not trying to hit you guys up on, I make a bunch. Like, for example, somebody ordered something recently, it was like $10, and shipping was $18. I was like, and I was amazed they bought it. <laughs> but I think they knew I'm going to refund like 12 of that, you know, and so they're going to get their piece of acrylic for 8 bucks, you know. Um, and that's just how the website's set up. And I don't know. I mean, we've got a new website in development now. They're going to be, uh, it's a massive undertaking to move all the content from the current website to the new one. So it's going to be, I don't know, weeks until we get that completed, make sure there's no bugs in the system. And then that goes out and we'll see what happens with the shipping modules at that point. I don't know. Um, I'd love some really nice way to handle that, but it's hard. You almost need like an AI built into the website that can say, well, that person's ordered from Oklahoma, but they bought something that's, you know, this big. And, you know, it, I could ship that for six bucks instead of 18, you know. And so we're going to put that in the six dollar box. It, it's just not that simple. Um, it's actually hard to do that. So anyway, um, enough about that. I just want you guys to know, you know, you're, I'm not going to always treat you right. I do my best and keep everyone as happy as I possibly can. And I thank you for those that choose to do business with me.
And while I'm talking about other things, we'll stick this on here too. Club Milos Reef is a great group on Facebook. We talk every single day there. Um, I share things there from time to time. I also share things on this page. Oh, I'm in the way. Let's see if I can shrink this down to make it fit. Don't you love live video? Um, so facebook.com slash Milos Reef is the Milos Reef Inc. page. That is the page that is associated with Facebook where I share fun things that I find on the web pretty much once a day. And uh, sometimes I'll post things on there that I sell as well because it's a business page. And then within that page is the group, which is Club Milos Reef. And Club Milos Reef is designed for hobbyists to ask questions and not be berated, not be put down, not be made fun of, not be attacked. Uh, because it's a, an attack-free zone. We are a group of people that like to help each other and answer questions and show off our systems and and talk about our ideas and, you know, it, it's great. So uh, we're coming up on 8,000 people. I'm very slow to add people. So it's been growing very quietly. And rather than just anyone can join, you know, I, I want it to be uh, the right people. And I do actually look at the people that are applying and I look to see if they answered the three questions. And if you don't even answer the questions, don't even get it thrown. You don't even get added to the group. You can't even do three questions. You're not in the group. But it's really important that uh, you understand the group is designed to be friendly and peaceful, and we have moderators to make sure it stays that way. And uh, if you like that type of environment, then we're the group for you. And if you don't like that environment, then do not come to our group. <laughs> Alrighty, and we're done with that. And I'll I'll turn this thing off too. Ready to go. Put myself in this upper corner here. All right, let's go to something else. Um, Macy's daddy asks a great question. How long would you wait for a new product to be out and tested before you would try and trust it on your reef? That's kind of a double question for me because even when I get something brand new, I don't even install it for a little while. I, I, uh, I, I need time to focus on the installation and I have to remove something to put it on and I have to think where it's going to go, how I'm going to secure it, how I'm going to control it. All those things come into play. So I, um, I like to see what's coming to market. That's why I go to MACNA. When you're at MACNA, the Marine Aquarium Conference of North America, they like to show off things that are in the pipeline, things that are in production now but aren't quite available to the public. And so it's a great way to get like a sneak peek of a new product. Um, there are beta testing groups for different companies where they will try out a new pump. And I've been a part of a few of those groups over the years and I've tried out different things to see how they worked. I was one of the guys that was trying out the Mindstream, for example. And, you know, they wanted feedback, they wanted to know how it worked, they wanted to know if we were happy, and, you know, it, that, me, it's, it's sort of like, I have a friend who got, who kept downloading the beta software that was going to go to the iPad and the iPhone. So he would get it early before it was the official release. And so we would try to FaceTime and his, his phone would crash. <laughs> And you'd say, ugh. And, you know, he'd have to reboot his phone or whatever, and we'd make our phone call, and then it would crash again. And I was like, you and that stupid beta software! Can't you just wait like the rest of us until it's ready? He goes, oh, I love new stuff. And that's not me. I don't love new stuff. <laughs> I like it to be stable and reliable. So when you ask, trying a new product, i have <sighs> It's hard to answer that question. And here's the thing that um, I'm keenly aware of that is actually concerning to me and uh you know i don't know why it bothers me so much but it does so for example let's take a specific product on the market right now the versa pump came out and i saw it in play and you know i saw it in advance and then i saw it at macna and then i got one and i'm running it and i like it and i read posts by people and they'll say Oh, I'm on my third Versa, and I don't know how they're breaking them, to be honest. I'm on my third Versa, and then someone chime in, yeah, why are you being a guinea pig? And I was like, it's, they're not a guinea pig. They bought a product. Ecotech has great customer support. If there's a problem, they'll resolve it. But people are kind of saying, you know, you should let everyone else suffer through it, and then you'll get it later when it's, when it's ready to sell. 
And I don't know, there's something about that mentality, that negative connotation that you're throwing out that this is a bad product because some people had an issue. Um, I know there was a batch of them that came out initially that had leaking connections where you put the hose in and Ecotech found out about the problem and they solved it and they sent out parts to everyone and it's been resolved, but you still see people saying, oh, yeah, you better watch out that you don't get a leaking one. Why are we still talking about it? That was a thing, it got fixed. And you could say that about any product. I'm just picking that one as a topic. Um, the, the negative connotations, the, the skepticism that's out there, it really seems to get legs under it and, it, and people just keep repeating it. And they turn the myth into a fact and they actually kill the, you know, the product or the company in the process. They're not making the product better with all their negativity. I guarantee you that. And it's, it's really a, a, a bad thing. I, I wish it would stop. <laughs> I, I get it. You know, we all have opinions. We all feel strongly about stuff. But unless they leave you high and dry and say, look, you keep breaking it, so we're not going to take care of you. Now you got a beef. Now you got something to actually complain about. I could see you, you know, saying negative stuff about the product. But I, you know, myself, I've been using Ecotech gear for a long time, and they came out with a new Radeon. I ordered the Radeon. I had to wait forever to get it, and I finally got it like a week ago. And it's not hooked up yet. <laughs> like I said, I'm not quick to jump on to new early adopter stuff. I want to set it up when I reset the tank, and so it's just waiting for me to do that now. Um, but it just depends on what it is. When I saw the Camor pump at Magna that was going to be the new feed pump for the calcium reactor, it's like the sky opened up and the angels in heaven were, were, were singing. And I was like, that's it. That's the pump of my dreams. I want it. And uh, I was like, I don't care what it costs, which of course I cared. And then they told me how much it was. And I think they told me it was like 300. I was like, done, I'll buy it. You know, tell me the minute it's available. So a couple weeks later I was told, you know, it's in. I was like, great, I'll take it. And then it was only 260. I was like, oh, cool, it's even less than I thought. And I ran that thing for, I don't know, eight, nine months. Uh, I replaced it with a Versa, and I'm loving my Versa. And then someone made a comment about how certain fluids being drawn through it ruin it. I don't know that that's true. I have, no, I have not heard that from anyone but this one person. And he was a person that was pulling the water through his calcium reactor into the Versa which I've been telling you guys for a while. I don't know why anyone's pulling water through a calcium reactor. It's the dumbest thing ever. I can't stand it. You push water into everything, including our tanks, but we're pulling water through a reactor. I don't understand why anyone's believing this. Today is rant day. Um, anyway, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but pulling lower pH water through or with alkalinity through tubing is supposed to ruin the tubing. I don't know how that's even possible, but if you're pushing it in, you're pushing in regular salt water, no problem at all. So maybe just pushing into the reactor is smarter than pulling it through. I don't know. But that was a weird one that I came across yesterday, so it's fresh on my mind. Okay, I need to get off of this topic and onto something more happy. I don't want to turn into Mark's rant hour. You know, I want our channel to be fun. Mike says, let's talk about building an aquarium stand. I love it. Thank you. Good topic. Okay, so aquarium stands, historically, when you buy at the store, seem to be made very thinly. There's, you know, some plywood, there's some planks, and it's done. And, you know, it's got some cabinet doors on it. Some are made of plastic, some are made of uh, glass. You know, there's all these different styles, but they're very thin. And then when people make their own, they love to use two-by-fours. And they make this ginormous, beefy, super strong, can't knock it down, would support two cars in a storm. <laughs> and while it's super strong, and it's easy to make yourself, uh, it limits the space within the stand to put in a sump or to put in any kind of gear because the 2 by 4s are so thick. And, you know, the more of them you have, the more legs you have. And some people use 2 by 6s It's even more lumber. And they really limit the space they have within. So, myself, I have... When I've made stands in the past, I use 3 quarter inch plywood. And I would reinforce as needed with 1 by material. Like, for example, 1 by 3 oak would be a nice rib on the inside or maybe a cross brace underneath the solid top to support it. But the plywood itself is, you know, let's call it four sides, you know, like a box with a top piece on top that sits on top of the plywood. Then when you set the tank on top of the plywood, it is equally supported and it's, it's on the edge of the plywood, so the plywood would not give. If you did it any other way, there are the tendency for it to be weak and uh, some kind of problem. Also, gluing and screwing it together is very important. 
because you want it to hold together and then you want to seal the stand with some kind of a sealer whether it's paint or like a, a uh, polyurethane type material to keep moisture out of the wood so the wood doesn't rot. It's very important. And if you do all of these things, you'll have a nice solid stand. I did a video showing a stand that I made for a customer a few years ago. And it's the only one that's on this channel, so it won't be too hard to find. And it came out really, really nice. I actually loved it. <laughs> I hadn't worked with wood like that in so long that it was fun. And I cut it all out on the CNC machine. So that was also a fun experiment because I hadn't done that before and I wanted to try it. And it came out really, really well. So, but I don't want to become a cabinet shop. But I do think I'll do it again and I'll do the woodwork around my aquarium and that'll let me play with some sawdust again. That'll be fun. But uh, is there anything wrong with 2x4s? No. Can you do it? Yes. Uh, if anything, I would recommend oversizing the stand bigger than the tank so you create like a six inch shelf on each end and across the front. So you have like a horseshoe shape shelf to put down a drink, put down test kits, kneel on it when you're working in the tank or stand on it when you're getting up high, you know, like you're installing lights. If you're going to make this big cabinet, make it a little bit bigger. And if you make it bigger, you actually create more space within it for the sump and the top of container and all your electronic gear. So uh, you can think about all those things when you're building it and you can create the perfect scenario. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster is asking us to talk about the proper way to start two-part dosing with details, please. All right, so I had someone ask me about a month ago. Um, they wanted to just basically automate everything, and you could tell they were really new to the hobby. And I said, what you need to do is set up your tank, hook up an apex, and learn how the tank works manually. Don't automatically dose anything. Don't do anything until you know what your tank needs because you're putting it in yourself by hand each day, pouring it in. And now you'll, you'll learn, like for example, my tank needs this much alkalinity poured in, and this much calcium poured in, and this much magnesium poured in, and you're testing the water every single week yourself. Uh, you can do it even more frequently, but let's just say once a week, because that's what I always recommend. And you could then adjust more or less of the manual dose you're pouring in, in each day to learn that spot. Then when you know what number you need on a daily basis, when you buy a dosing pump to trickle it in, you already know the number. You're going to take the same stuff you're using now, whether it's ESV or it's a, a DIY powder that you're mixing up, or it's a bottle from Brightwell, or it's a bottle from Kent, or it's a bottle from you know whoever. You're just going to put the tubing from the dosing pump into that bottle of solution and you're going to program the exact same amount of numbers of milliliters you were pouring in by hand. So like I said, if you're using 15 milliliters, you could then tell doser, put in 15 milliliters, and that's going to go into my tank every single day. And you can say, do it at 8 a.m. And then the doser says, you got it, and it does the job. And then you get the second dosing pump, and you say, okay, I want to add calcium. Well, I recommend you dose that in the afternoon or evening or 12 hours later. So you could set that up to dose you know, at 8 p.m., for example. And magnesium, you can dose anytime. It doesn't matter. That has no bearing on anything. It just can go in the system. And you can have the third doser, and it's putting in that amount of magnesium. Then your job, of course, is to calibrate the doser to make sure it's putting in the right amount. So you've got to follow the calibration routine, make sure the dosing pump literally matches the number. So, for example, if you ask for 15 milliliters to be dosed, does it give you 15? You know, if it gives you 60 or it gives you 1, you know you need to recalibrate it and get it correct so it's actually putting in the number you want. The other thing is the tubes that the liquids come out of all your dosers has to be above the water line at all times because if it touches the salt water, they clog shut. And you should always take the tubing and between your fingers rub it to break up any crystallizing inside of it and then hit the, you know, the button or do something on the app or whatever it is to verify liquid is coming out. Just kind of hold the button down for a few seconds and it squirts out some liquid. Okay, good. Go to the next pump, do the same thing. Good. The next thing, okay, all my dosing pumps are working properly, all my dosing solutions are full, all my dosers are dosing the right amount, and my test results are showing I'm getting the right amount every day. And then if the tank seems to use up more alkalinity and it's not getting enough, you increase the dose slightly. Now, some people say, well, I want to dose 24 times a day, or every 30 minutes. You can, but I don't really see the need. I'd, I'd rather just dose for a fixed amount of minutes and get it done. But if you want to divide it out over a period, like you want to do some alkaline at 8 o'clock, and then some at 10 o'clock, and some at noon, and some at 2, and some at 4, 
I guess you could, but I'd rather put it all in at 8 a.m. And the reason I do that is that's when the pH is the lowest in your tank. And while pH is low, dosing alkalinity will raise the pH up. So if you put in most of your alkalinity in the morning period, it's already buffering it up to where it needs to be, and your pH gets the boost. But um, so that's how I would handle it. And uh, then, you, like I said, weekly you test and make sure you're on track. And if there's any adjustments, you make minor little adjustments. You don't go crazy. And if you are doing water changes, you want to make sure that your water changes and throwing off your water chemistry so far that the dosers can't keep up. I think that's about it. Yeah, I hope that was enough detail. Looking for the next question. All right, I'm just going to put it on the screen and read it out loud. I'm soon upgrading my reef. I currently use a type of carbon dosing, JBL, bionitratex, and it is working fantastic, but the new system is going to use a refugium. So how do I not get a spike? Um, the refugium should not affect whatever you're doing now. It's just a new extra zone of the sump or an extra tank that has macroalgae in it, possibly some sand or some media. Um, it's just an area that is predator free so you can grow pods and grow macroalgae. I don't think it's going to change anything from what you're doing now, but uh, obviously you're going to have to watch things closely. Um, when you set up the refugium, you said you're going to upgrade your reef. So the tanks can be kind of new when you upgrade. If it's a tank transfer and you're moving all the livestock over, then you're going to have a pretty good bio load from the beginning. But if the tank is really new, like you're starting, you know, I'm starting up a new tank, you know, then you're going to have kind of like this empty tank. Don't do the refugium yet. Let the tank get established. Let it go a few months. And then after this time period has gone by, you may see now is the right time to incorporate a refugium. Now, if you already have the system in place, you can have water running through it, but there's no point putting plants in there because they're not going to survive because of the lack of uh, biodiversity in the tank. There's just not enough stuff in there to keep the plants alive. <clears throat> and it's not like a house plant. A house plant, you put it in a pot, you stick it near a window, and you water it and it grows. In a reef tank, if there's not the right amount of stuff in the water, those plants will just wither away rather than just grow. You th they're not a tree necessarily. They're, they just don't do what you're thinking because they need stuff. And if the tank is too new and pristine, it can't do it. And with carbon dosing, you're lowering the nitrate and phosphate through carbon dosing. So you're actually taking away the stuff that the refugium wants. So I would hold off for a little while before you put plants in there. If you want to establish it with some sand and rock, or you want to put in some kind of biomedia down in there for bacteria purposes and you're doing your thing, that's fine. But after a little while, then put in plants. And I would put in a decent amount, not just not one little ball. Like if you're buying it from a company like Algae Barn and they sell it, you know, like this little jar, get like six jars and put all of that in the refugium so you have a decent amount of plants so there's some mass to work with. Because I, when you see this big refugium zone, it's like all this horrible, you know, gross algae growing everywhere. And you see this one little speck of calerpa or this little speck of ketomorpha. And like, why isn't it growing? And so, well, look at all the rest of it. It's, nothing would grow in there. <laughs> it's just the system's not ready for it. So it needs more plant. Everyone always asks me about Vibrant. I don't know. Uh, he says, uh, does Vibrant kill coralline? I don't know. I don't know. I need to learn more about Vibrant. I really do. So I can start saying, yes, I know the answer to that. I've never used it. have no need. Let's see. How are we doing on time? All right. We're an hour and a half in. 210 people are here. Hi, everybody. Let's see. My coffee's cold. I'm looking for the next question. Oh, deal! thank you very much for the super chat. What is this pear-shaped character? <laughs> I need information. Something's going on. I think I'm missing a joke. Uh, Macy's daddy says, your thoughts on micro-bubbling, micro-bubble scrubbing to treat dinoflagellates? If you want to try it, try it. 
Um, some people have done it with success. Some people have done it and didn't see a difference. Um, I know Tammy did it, and she felt like it made a difference in her tank. Uh, you have to do it exactly the way they recommend. It can't just be your way of doing it. Uh, you need micro bubbles. It's like fizz. It's not bubbles. Um, the, the tinier, the, the finer, the, it's like mist. And that mist goes throughout the entire tank and basically sticks to the dynos and makes the dynos float up and float out and land in a filter sock, for example. Um, that's the principle behind it. Uh, I don't fight dino flagellates, so I haven't got any personal experience trying this micro bubble thing, but I do know that anytime we pump air into an aquarium, we get salt creep everywhere and you have a lot of cleanup. And the other thing is, if you're trying to do it through your return pump, your nozzles are pointing straight ahead. You'd have to point them down to get the bubbles down to where the dinos are. And to do that puts your tank at risk that if there's a power outage, because the nozzles are pointing down, that the water level will siphon down, 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 down to the nozzle in a power outage or a pump failure. And so if that happens, you could have a lot of water on the floor. So we don't want that to happen. Um, uh, Robert asked a question about the Trident and the test results. So he said, you know, one of the things you have to do is you have to calibrate it. But uh, he asked, are they accurate? And my biggest doubt forever was magnesium. I didn't believe that it was telling me the right number of magnesium. It always seemed lower than my test kit. Or maybe it was higher. It's been so long. Um, but it was, it was off like 100, and it never seemed to be right, and I couldn't understand why. And then eventually I replaced the test kit, and the test kit matched the Trident. And I was like, oh, my mistake. So, uh, yeah. But no, historically I find they're actually pretty close. And what's really nice is when you use your own test kit, and you look at the Trident, and you send off an ICP test all from the same water sample, and you see they all match, that's, that's way more promising. Now, uh, Robert was saying that his alkaline was 1 dKH higher with his Hannah Checker than it was what the, uh, what the uh, Trident said. And that is a big difference in number, and I would, I would see you need to test it with one more kit. I'd buy something. Tropic Marin had a great alkalinity test kit that was inexpensive. I like Elos. It's really simple to use. I sell the Elos test kit on my website if you want to try that one out. It's so easy to use. It's so inexpensive. I really like it for a good way to verify things when I have any doubts about something else. And you got to remember, I was a guy that had the Trident tell me one number. I had the Mindstream tell me another. I had ICP tell me something else. And I had my test kits. And it was super hard to know what to believe at that point. So... Uh, but I would start with calibrating first and see what's going on there um, with your Trident before I would start doubting it. I, I think it's probably more likely accurate than not. Uh, Michael says, how's your algae turf scrubber? I just ordered mine. Congratulations! Uh, it's doing well, and my black piece of polycarbonate in the bottom of the drawer worked like a charm. So I was getting this weird, you know, I mean, algae's growing in it, but it was growing inside the bottom of the box. It was bad down there. And I was like, look at all this. This isn't right. And so I, uh, I cut out this piece of black polycarbonate and I dropped it into the, the box that the sheet is in. And so now it blocks the light from going out the bottom and I slid the drawer in and now it creates a nice black shadow and everything underneath doesn't get light anymore. And I contacted Jason at Foursquare Aquatics and said, so I've done this thing. I have this idea. I think it'll make it be better. And not only did he love the idea and he thanked me for the feedback, now he's making them with a black bottom so that way it won't do that anymore. And now when I pull the drawer out, the bottom of my algae turf scrubber is super clean. It's just water. There's no weird algae down there. I mean, I had bubble algae down there, hair algae down there. There was cyano. There was all this crap. It was unbelievable and it was building up. And I felt like it was just going to get thicker and thicker and then more water is going to go down all the drains and it was going to be a problem. And so I was scraping it out and it was a lot of work. And the black bottom solved it completely. It was really great. So I really do like it. Uh, Martinez, no, I've never run the, the sulfur denitrator. Um, and I've never done the, uh, the other one. Um, I've done vodka dosing. Uh, there's another one where you use like rocket fuel or racing fuel uh, methanol. I think that's right. I've never done that. Uh, that's the one thing I haven't done or that, that direction. I was going to at one point and I didn't. 
Um, Sid says my alkalinity is at 6.9 and O at 7.8. I don't know what's happening here. I think this is text to speak. 10% uh, water change didn't change it. No, water changes aren't going to change your alkalinity typically unless your water change is way higher. Like if your water change had like 15 alkalinity and you put it in a tank that's 7.0, that uh, might see a slight spike. But uh, your water change is your water change and you dose what your tank needs. That's what you got to do. <laughs> Metrocat says, you're not vertical today. Oh yeah, back to the photography question. <laughs> Never shoot videos vertically. It's the most offensive thing you could do. You're not supposed to do that. Or start turning all your beautiful huge TVs on their side on the wall so it's vertical. Video is always horizontal. There's only a couple times when vertical video makes sense. Um, like fireworks going straight up. The rocket launch going straight up. That makes sense. But everyone that shoots video vertically and then they pan back and forth to show you everything happening, if they just turn the phone sideways, we'd see it all. We could actually not miss the action because it would all be in the frame. Because invariably, the person filming always has the camera pointing in the wrong direction when something's happening off to the side, and they pan back to it because they're doing it vertically. So I highly urge you to turn your phone sideways, like a camera, and shoot video. Yeah, that whole vertical thing she's joking about is because we were doing it on Instagram a week ago. Charlie says he got his temperature solved from the last live stream. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Let's see. Jason says, I have your 100-gallon-a-day RODI system. I was wondering when I should change out the membrane. The membrane can be good between one and five years, and that's a huge window. But the problem is everyone's water changes from county to county. Your membrane might last three years, it might last four years, it might last five years. It can go a long time. The way you know if the membrane is bad is by measuring TDS. So if you are making water now, you've had the system a month or two, and you're testing and the water coming out of the membrane is measuring, I don't know, six or 13 or something before the DI stage. Just know that number in your head or put a little note by the RODI system if you want. And then one day if it's coming out at 80 or 100 or some crazy number, now the membrane's shot. Or, if no water's coming out at all because the membrane's so clogged up that you're, you're used to get five gallons in an hour and now you're getting a quarter of a gallon. That means all the water's going on the waste, nothing's coming out of the good, the membrane is shot, has to be replaced. That's the couple of ways of knowing. So either super high TDS coming out of the membrane or no water coming out, you know, where the production rate just plummets really badly. And I mean badly. Not like I was getting five and now I'm only getting four because it's winter. Because in the winter, your RO system is going to work slower because the water is so much colder coming out of the pipes. And that's completely normal. A 100-gallon-a-day membrane that's getting 50-degree water will be a 50-gallon-a-day membrane. Just, that's just how it works. It's, is it physics? I don't know. It's something like physics. So uh, just know that if your water's colder, it's slower. But if it goes from making 5 gallons an hour to like a quarter of a gallon, a half a gallon, a gallon, that's all. That's not cold water. That's a bad membrane. you got to replace it. Tammy, uh, I want you to understand my whole open mouth thing is not calling you a mouth breather. <laughs> she said, I didn't know if any of the corals can sting me. I have carpal tunnel, so I don't feel very well when something cuts, burns, etc. When you're placing an anemone in the tank, it could even sting the inside of your wrist with its tentacles, and you could look like you got hit by fire ants. The problem is, a lot of times, people don't notice what they do with their mouth when they're working. They just don't think about it. They're busy, focused on the thing, and some people, their mouth hangs open. And if your mouth is open and you're touching anything and it squirts into your mouth, you just got it in your mouth. So I'm saying keep your mouth closed. That's not just you. That's everybody. And I have watched it numerous times where people are, or you're just talking while you're working. I mean, look, I'm live streaming. I, you don't see me handling corals right now, but I mean, I've, I've had to do a couple of streams and I had to keep myself away from the product as I'm working with those corals to make sure nothing gets in my mouth as I was talking to the camera. But it, it is a, a real thing. You can get scored in the eye or in the mouth or on the face from clams, from zooanthids. Um, what else could get you? 
uh, anemones don't really squirt unless you squeeze the heck out of it. But also, if you were like holding a rock and you're scraping Mahanos off or Aptasia, you could get squirt toward the mouth or toward your face. Uh, I mean, now everyone's got these PPEs, you know, these face shields. That a face shield would protect everything. You can have your mouth hanging open all day long. But it, no, it's legit. I tell people keep your mouth shut, have your eye protection. If you want, wear gloves. And uh, yeah, if you're susceptible to getting anything from handling certain things, you'll kind of learn. If I mean, it's almost like an allergy. And obviously you don't want that, but I mean, you might find I can touch a leather coral all day long, but if I touch mushrooms, I don't feel well later that day, then you would definitely wear gloves with mushrooms, for example. It's one of those things. But most of the stuff we buy is relatively benign to handle for the little bit we're touching it. You know, we're just touching it long enough to make sure it's clean, and then we put it in our tank and we stop touching it. But uh, some people are like fragging all the time or pushing it through a wet saw. And they're like my friend Drew, with his friend, you know, the two, the two of them were fragging a lot of corals, and they, I feel like they said they were, I might be mixing up the story, but I feel like they said they were outside, but they were working around the wet saw, and I guarantee you they were, had their mouths open, they were talking, and they inhaled so much stuff, they ended up in the ER, respiratory stuff going on. They basically felt like they had palytoxin uh, poisoning. So, and it wasn't that they got it on them, it's that they're using a wet saw, which is a blade that spins and throws off water, and the mist was being inhaled, and they felt sick. They had fever. They tasted metal. You know, all these things happen. So it's very important to be aware of what you are doing as a person around the corals when they're not submerged in water. That's all. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, Kat says they have these uh, these little finger condoms that you can use to put over a finger that have a, a cut. Uh, that would be a good way to keep your finger sealed. Um, also, if you want to be crazy, you can put super glue gel over it or super glue over the skin first to really seal it. That way, when you work in the tank, it's sealed off. And then later on, you know, you can peel it off underwater and expose your cut and leave it open to the air again. Uh, Raul says, what is your opinion on not running a protein skimmer because of roller mat filters? I use both and still my protein skimmer pulls out a lot of stuff out of the tank. Yeah, keep the skimmer going. The roller mat's doing one thing, the skimmer's doing another. You want them both. Jason says, what's the best way to add caulk to your tank, caulk washer? Uh, the best way is to make an independent amount, whatever, I'm just going to take a random number out of the air, one gallon. And let's say you want to drip in one gallon of that into your tank every night, and that's all that can go in. I don't like the, the risk of having a whole bunch of it near your tank and having the opportunity of all of it getting into your tank accidentally at once, which happens to a lot of people. So if I was going to use caulk washer on my tank, I would have a one gallon container set up on my sump, and I would put in the caulk washer solution I've mixed up, and I would have that drip into the system overnight, and that's it. It's done. And that's what they do at public aquariums. They don't have massive batches, 55 gallons waiting next to the system. They put a five gallon bucket on the edge of the display. You know, when you go behind those beautiful displays, it's all concrete. They have a bucket there with a spigot and they put in three or four or five gallons of caulk washer and that drips into the tank that day. And when it's empty, it's done. They don't automate it with like a, a 500 gallon batch of caulk washer that'll take care of the tank for the whole month. And they never have a caulk washer overdose that kills their entire reef and because they're public. And unfortunately, so many people have made the mistake of trusting that stuff is so dangerous. That's why I don't use it. I don't recommend it. Um, that's why I don't use it. <laughs> I tried using it year, back in 2004 for a while and it was very messy. And the risk factor, I mean, that's got a pH of 12. And I read hundreds of threads of people where they nuke their tank with caulk washer. And I just don't take the chance. So when you're asking what's the best way, the best way is to limit how much can be added to where no more could be added no matter what. If the dosing pump goes crazy, there's nothing left. You know, if you're going to trickle it in, there, the containers ran dry. That's how I would do it. And that's a lot of manual labor, having to put in a certain amount every single day and not have a nice big body of it ready to go. Uh, Randy Holmes Farley, who's one of, I'd say he's one of the foremost reef chemistry guys we know, he mixes up a 45-gallon barrel of it every single month for his top-off, 
and somehow nothing bad's ever happened to him. But like I said, hundreds of threads I read over and over and over. People turned their whole tank to milk and they're just looking for anything that survived and most of it died and it started from scratch. And I said, I'm, that's not gonna be me. I'm not gonna take that chance. So that's my suggestion. Oh yes, uh, just some guy says, you don't need the 800 gallon Apex, the Classic would work fine. The Apex Classic still exists, you can buy it from other people. If I don't think you'll be able to buy it new anywhere. I don't know who else that still sells that because it's been out for a long time. But if you can buy a used one, you can save money, but it's not gonna have all the abilities that the new Apex can do. So there is that side. And like if you said, well, at some point I wanna add this thing, it has to be the new Apex. Like for example, if you wanted to run the Trident, uh, if you wanted to control the dose, if you wanted to monitor the power consumption of each outlet to let you know when a pump is failing, for example. Can't do that with the Apex Classic. I had the Apex Classic all the way up to about two years ago. I think that's when I, sh I jumped ship and went to the new Apex. But yeah, you can start with that, save some money. Uh, PP says, do you have any experience with GHL? Any thoughts on GHL? I don't have any experience with it, I've seen it. Um, I liked their system where they had basically a case, kind of like a, like a modem, and you could open it up and you could put in all the cards you wanted, like a PC, and pick the things you wanted to use instead of just being told, here are all your components, you could buy the ones you liked and install them yourself. It's kind of neat. Um, it, I don't think it, um, well, I mean, in the US it didn't become mainstream. You don't have tons of GHL owners from what I can tell, but there seems to be a lot of Apex owners out there. And uh, Revo said, what is YPAT? You pick a topic. That was today's uh, discussion. I was letting the audience pick the topics earlier in the first hour of the stream. All right, looking for the next question. Remember, do at Milo's Reef so I can find your questions. Our seller says, what about having the backup pump plumbed and ready to go if you're out of town or on vacation? Actually, what I would do if you're out of town or on vacation and you're going to have someone else there to keep keep an eye on the tank. If you could have the replacement pump handy, like in plain sight, with the union already installed on it, then they could unscrew the union, swap out the pump, unplug the bad pump, plug in the good one. Even then, that's asking a lot because there's a lot of cords and a lot of tubes and a lot of stuff going on in our system, and there's just a chance that they're going to mess something up. But anything you could do to simplify it, would be ideal. So if you could have it pre-plumbed, in other words, have it ready to screw onto some, you know, onto a union really easily, that would be the ideal. And that's what I would suggest. But having it actually tied in and turned on or, or just sitting there but unplugged, I wouldn't go to that route. I mean, I wouldn't. I just tell the tank sitter what I want. <laughs> I remember one time he uh, sent me a message and he said, yeah, your calcium reactor wasn't working right, so I took it all apart and I fixed it. <laughs> and I was shocked because he doesn't even own a calcium reactor. I'm thinking, how does he know how one works? Now, he's super smart, and you know, I don't know why, I, but my, third, my gut instinct was like, he's never used one. Somehow he's fixing mine. How does he know these things? You know, and I was really nervous, but he fixed it. <laughs> so that was good. Got lucky. Jason says, water changes have been long overdue, so today's the day, and I'm repping the Milo's Reef t-shirt. Nice job. He must have got it from YouTube. Thanks for buying that. I'm wearing the Benepets shirt today. Uh, this is the one that uh, does the Benereef foods. I wanted to just mention it today. I, was, I found the shirt in my pile. I was like, I haven't worn this in forever. So Benereef is one of the foods that I sell here on my website. So this is a small jar, medium jar, and then the nice large jar. And this is a reef food that you mix up for five minutes. So you put it in some tank water for five minutes and let it activate the bacteria in it. And then you put it in the tank and you can use it for broadcast feeding or you can mix it up like a slurry and you can actually target feed. And uh, I've been using this stuff for the last couple of years, I guess now. And I really like it because it doesn't create cyano or other algae issues. And it makes the glass stay clean longer on the tank, which is huge. I just love that. I, I joked with them a while back. I remember I was on their Facebook page and on their Facebook page it says, 
hi, thank you for coming to the Benepeds page. If you have any questions, you know, ask us below. And so I wrote, hi, my name is Mark, and I was wanting to know, well, I just wanted to tell you that when I put in your food in my tank, my glass stays clean longer. I noticed today my glass was dirty, so instead of cleaning my glass, I just put in more of your food. <laughs> and then the owner, of course, running the page saw it and he laughed out loud, which was perfect. Um, but yeah, it's really neat how it does it. It keeps the glass clean longer. Um, it doesn't create problems and it feeds your corals, which is awesome. And uh, so I, I have the, all three sizes on my website in case you're interested in getting it. Let's see. Andrea's screaming at me, it's tray voltage. I don't know what she's talking about. Odile says, how's your mom? Well, she's alive, but uh, that's all I know. Uh, Pickle Boy says, do you sell the Apex system on your website? Yes, I do. It is on there. There's a lot of components on there, and there's some things on there that are not on the website that I have in stock as well. Sometimes people say, do you have this? I'm like, I do. <laughs> and they're like, oh, cool. Uh, Pickle Boy says, how do you feel about using Coral RX to dip your corals? It's a good coral dip. I used it for a long time. I just ran out. I've got some other ones on the shelf now just because I have them. Ryan says, I really like listening to you and people's questions. It's a good way to spend the evening in the UK. Well, I hope you're staying safe over there in the UK. Um, Odile says, do you ever turn your skimmer once in a while? Turn it? Turn it off? Turn it on? Turn it in a different orientation? I feel like we're missing a word. Uh, my skimmer's on all the time. Uh, Glenn says, with the summer months being hotter, do you find any corals in the aquarium speeding up with growth? My tank doesn't really notice the temperature so much. I mean, it probably goes up half a degree during the summer and then, you know, it drops about a half a degree for the winter months. But I think they just kind of grow the normal speed. I don't really notice any, like, burst of growth in the summer or the spring or the fall. I've never really noticed that. Mujuf says, do you have a top five fish list for beginners? I don't. Um, I, I've never really embraced the whole top five, top ten list thing. Uh, there's another channel that does that. Um, Somebody remind me. Uh, his name is Jeff. Uh, why can't I think of his name right now? He loves top 10 lists. <laughs> and he might have a good list for you. But I don't have one. Because the thing is, I don't know what size tank you have. And I don't know what livestock you want. So it's really hard to give you a list of like, these are the five fish you should get. Because you might not even like that type of fish. Or you might plan something. You know, you might say, well, I definitely want a frogfish. Well, frogfish eat other fish. And so if you have, like, the five I recommended and you drop in your frogfish, you might have one frogfish and no other fish. So it's really hard to answer that one. AK says it's 6.30 in the morning, Sunday morning. You're in the future. What are the lottery numbers? Um, in Eastern Australia, and I finally caught you live. Shout out to Mike and Keith who helped me with a question about Purigen and CyanRx in the group. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in so early on your Sunday, the day of rest. Uh, Steve says, my Duncan has grown a lot, uh, six large heads. Is it difficult to frag? Uh, I don't think it's that bad. I mean, I haven't fragged mine. <laughs> but I don't think it's that difficult. I don't think their skeleton is that hard. I know a hammer coral is much easier to frag in comparison. I would prefer it if you had a wet saw to cut it, but I think you could use bone cutters and go in there and just trim between some branches if you felt the need. Or maybe you could trim at the base and have one large branch and another large branch and separate them in to two places in your aquarium. That would be nice. Uh, Michael Wells says, speaking of new products, have you heard about the new Hanna nitrate checker? I have heard about it. Everyone was like, did you know? And I was like, I can't wait. And then it turns out it only measures up to five. And I was like, worthless to me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if that's true, if it only measures from like zero to five, it, I can't, I can't ever use it. Um, so it's not going to benefit me. But a lot of you guys with your super low phosphate, super low nitrate tanks, might benefit from it very greatly. I guess they're really cornering the market on ultra low nutrient systems. Mm. 
Let's see. Uh, Damon says, I've been using Kalkwasser and I cannot keep up with the demands of the tank. I'm switching to two-part. Should I slowly reduce the Kalkwasser or can I stop using Kalkwasser and use two-part? Okay, so there's a couple things you can do there. You can actually keep using Kalkwasser as well as two-part if you wanted. Most people seem to like using Kalkwasser as their top-off. And the reason being is because they have this vessel of RODI water. They can put in the Kalkwasser solution. They can stir it all up, let it settle and then that will go into the tank as evaporation occurs. The problem is, is that evaporation varies from day to day. It varies due to weather, it varies due to humidity. I mean, there's a lot of factors. And so you might get a ton of evaporation in the summer and only get a little bit of evaporation in the winter. So in the winter, you only get a little bit of top off, which means only a little bit of Kalkwasser. But in the summer, you're putting in way too much Kalkwasser because it's topping off like crazy. So if that's the scenario, that's why it's so hard to control uh, the situation and keep your numbers in check because it's so you're almost having to like use weaker strength caulk washer in the summer stronger strength in the winter but there's only a certain amount of strength you can only go to a certain point and then it just settles out so that's what I was saying before I'd rather you just dose the amount whatever this random number is let's say you always want to put in one quart every day so you dose a quart of that every single night which by the way uh, Kalkwasser does a couple things. It, it's supposed to be a balanced way to keep alkaline calcium in check if it's already where it belongs. It doesn't fix it, but it'll keep it where it needs to be if it's already in the right spot. But it can also help bind up phosphates, which makes people happy because they want to keep their phosphates under control. And uh, it helps to buffer up pH because the pH is 12 coming out of the solution. So you've got those things in your favor, but it's so messy and there's so much cleanup. I just hate the whole rinsing out and there's a sludge everywhere and it ruins pumps. Pumps get built up, it like gets attracted to the magnets and people are taking their pumps apart and trying to clean the impellers and it's a real beating. So I just like, I don't want anything to do with it. But if you want to do dosing two part, you could say, well, I, you know, I'm just taking random numbers out of the air. 100 gallon tank needs 30 milliliters of alkalinity, it needs 18 milliliters of calcium, it needs 10 milliliters of magnesium and it needs one quart of Kalkwasser a day, for example. You could do something like that, and you could just see how everything runs and keep you know, testing and see how the numbers play out. And that way you get the benefit of binding up the phosphate, you get the benefit of the pH being up a little higher, and you're still giving the alkaline calcium that the tank needs and magnesium, and it all works out. But it comes down to, do you want to keep mixing up this stuff? Now, if you had a big barrel of 45 gallons of Kalkwasser in a, in a closet, or in, in the room behind the aquarium, for example, and you could go in and scoop out a pitcher of it, and then that goes in for your quart of the day, that's safe because you're manually having to carry it from one room to the next, and you're not going to overdose and kill your tank. But uh, I wouldn't tie that into a float valve, for example. I, I would never do that because 45 gallons of caulkwasser going into any tank is going <laughs> to... It's going to be bad news. So, uh, But yeah, and do you... If you say, well, look, I just want to stop doing call cluster all together and I just want to go with dosing two-part, you definitely can. I mean, it's not an either-or or you have to do both. You can choose. In the old days, people only had call cluster. That's what they used. It was cluster or a calcium reactor. Call cluster was dirt cheap because it's pickling lime. Calcium reactor was hundreds of dollars and people were like, oh. So they'd say, I'll use call cluster. And then Randy Holmes Farley came out with that great article, how to make your own DIY uh, two-part solution and he made that stuff and uh, he told us how to make it and we knew where to go buy these ingredients and we could make our own it was fantastic and so people didn't have to get a calcium reactor they could just make it but I, I'll tell you everyone that had like 150 and bigger I'd say even smaller I think there's some people well, I mean I remember one guy I think his name was lunch bucket on the uh, on reef central and uh, I feel like his tank was like a 75 or something, or a 90 gallon. And he had a calcium reactor next to it, and he was really proud of it. It was beautiful. And he had it set up there where everyone could see it. <laughs> there's the tank, there's the stand, there's the calcium reactor. And I was like, ooh, what's that thing do? You know, he's like, that's my calcium reactor. It keeps up with alkaline and calcium. I'm like, that's awesome. We all wanted one. So back in the day, you either did two-part or call cluster, or you did the calcium reactor. Then you had people that did a hybrid, and they did calcium reactor plus Kalkwasser. And like I said, I just chose to only do calcium reactor, and that's what I've been doing for the last 16 years. And uh, I don't want anything to do with Kalkwasser. So, yeah, you can actually stop completely if you wanted to. 
Um, AK says, do I have to mount the MP10 Vortec cable clip onto the glass directly above the power head? It's ugly. It's an all-in-one tank mounted on the side. Would like the clip on the back internal sump, 45 degrees, not 90. Uh, yeah, no, you want it at the top. The reason you want it at the top is so that if the inner part comes off and the outer part tries to drop, it can't drop. If you have it anywhere else, the entire motor can swing and fall, and if there's enough momentum, it can pull that little sticker right off the glass, and that thing will hit the ground, and it'll dent the bearings and destroy the pump. So I've always secured them from the top. I f actually love it. Um, I have no regrets about it. I don't know that it's ugly. Um, it's just a necessary evil. If you had any other pump on your tank right now, you'd have a wire coming out of the tank over the top too. So you can run it up, you can turn it at a 90, run it across, and put another clip there and have it come down. And that's that. And like I said, your pump won't fall and hit the ground. And I, that's the biggest selling point for me. You can get um, the black. They come with a black sticky pad, but they have like a white sticker on there. And you can peel that off and you can put the 3M gray tape. It, it makes it almost black. And you just put it up there. And I mean, it's there. But if you have a pretty reef, very few people are going to notice a wire or a sticky pad and say, why is that there? They're going to be looking at the corals and the fish. So I, I wouldn't sweat it. But I would definitely have it on top. And those, you know, when people like run the wire straight down, I just roll my eyes. Because I just know when that thing finally does come apart, it's going to cost hundreds to fix. So I don't recommend that. And yes, Taimiga says, dosing is hard compared to a calcium reactor, and I totally agree. Uh, Robert says, how was the trip out of town the other week? Well, it was fine. Um, I went to see my mom. She's very, 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 very sick. And uh, so I went to see her while she was still semi-normal. And... Uh, I will have to go again, but I drove because I don't want to get coronavirus, and uh, it was about 13 hours each direction, drive time, plus, you know, stops, and uh, the only downside of the trip was that I got a ding in my windshield from a car in front of me that threw a rock, and I took it to Toyota, and they, they had their guy fix it because I had coverage for it, but now there's a white circle in the middle of my windshield, which I didn't know was a thing. I thought they put in like a clear resin and it just kind of magically is almost invisible but I have this weird dot and it's the exact center of the entire windshield it's like dead center dead center right there it's really weird but it's fixed for now and hopefully I won't have a crack that just spreads across because it's been repaired Karsten is here from Denmark thank you for tuning in that's awesome uh, Devin says and someone else said vibrant does not kill coralline Thank you very much, guys, because, like I said, I don't know. Fabio is here from Brazil. Man, all the international crowd is here. I guess the clocks are perfect for all the people around the world right now. The perfect time to log on to a live stream. Um, uh, Gitesh says, does a 7500 Kelvin LED fixture good for growing ketomorpha? Uh... No, I don't like that number. I'd rather you get 5,100 Kelvin if you can get your hands on it. Um, people are doing things way lower to like 3,000 Kelvin or even lower, way into the reds. But I like that daylight look, uh, 5,100 Kelvin to 6,500. But 7,500, no, I don't think it's going to do well. I think you're going to grow some things you don't want to grow with that one. So I would avoid that one. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing? He's a local club member. Uh, Martinez, no, I wasn't aware of this. I'd have to read the uh, the thread. If you can, send me the thread so I can check it out. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. He says, my tank looks awesome. Bro. Uh, Tim Mattel says, I found some marine chips from Instant Ocean. Is this the brand you like? If so, I can send it to you. No, I've, I've got plenty. Thank you very much. It, you should use it in your tank. Enjoy. Uh, Tammy, you said, she said, sorry, I listened to an old stream today where you were talking about mouth breathers. Uh, that was probably, again, something to do with frags and keeping your mouth shut while you're working on corals. <laughs> I 
I mean, I probably said don't be a mouth breather. That's probably what I said. Let's see. <clears throat> Don't lick those zoanthids. Uh, Tanner says, what kits do you recommend for calcium and magnesium testing? I use ELOS. I like them. Uh, I think that they're easy to use. I mean, they're a little, there's a little bit to them, but they're, you're not wondering if you're right about the, the color. And uh, I sell them. <laughs> I know. Sounds like such a sales pitch. I sell the things I use myself, and that's what I've been doing now for many years. I feel like it's a good method because I can actually talk about it. Like, if you guys kept asking about Vibrant and I sold it, but I knew nothing, I'd feel like an idiot. So I don't sell Vibrant because I know nothing about it. I sell the things I use. Um, PP, I'm gonna just keep calling you that because I don't know what your name is. Is reefing here on YouTube and selling your acrylics what you do for a living or do you have another full-time work as well? I am full-time Milo's Reef. Uh, I am educating people every single week I am building acrylic products. I'm selling dry goods. My website is full of things I sell. Um, I literally made Milo's Reef my website, uh, my, my business uh, in 2009. And before that, I stripped and waxed floors. So I was a professional stripper for a long time, and I got sick of it and quit. And so I've been selling uh, products for my website. I told myself I will either make money and survive, or I'll starve to death and I'll die and I won't have to work anymore. So it was one or the other and I am still eating, so that's a good sign. And this is all I do. I work every single day, and I, I'm online answering questions, answering emails, answering texts, building stuff. Last night I made a bunch of stuff. I'll show you a few things I made. Here is a skimmer stand going to a customer. It's actually a replacement to the one I sent him because somehow he ordered one size, and I wrote down the wrong number, built the wrong number, shipped the wrong number, and he got it. <laughs> so I had to make a new one. So this one here, I got to peel off the paper and polish it and put a sticker on there, and this is going out. I made a bunch of my auto feeder chimneys that fit on to the top of a tank, like a Eurobrace tank or on the overflow cover. I made a bunch of power brick holders. So this one here is for four power bricks to sit, you know, screwed to the cabinet for power supplies for different pumps. I made a supersized one that holds six power bricks due to popular request. I made uh, a frag plug tray that'll fit in a frag tank. This one here will fit a 40 breeder front to back. So this is 17 and a quarter inches long. And I forget, I think it's... It can hold 55 frag, frag uh, plugs. Uh, so that's some of the stuff I built last night, and I've got more stuff to build. I've got a whole list of customers I take care of, and this is what I do. I um, I love my business. It's it's doing really well thanks to you guys. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, it'll actually, if I had been doing what I was doing previously during COVID-19, I would have been unemployed because everything closed, and I cleaned floors, and I cleaned floors in homes and in businesses, and no one would let you in their home because they don't want to get it. And no businesses were open. So I would have just starved to death. So I'm actually lucky. I don't know how I, I knew what to do 10 years ago, but it was the right choice. And plus, I like what I do. So I, um, I write articles and blogs. I do public speaking. And it's all reef related. And I do the YouTube thing. And I sell acry uh, acrylic wares. I don't sell livestock. That's the one thing I don't do. Let's see, already answered that. Uh, Charlie says, do you know of anything that hosts or lives in bubble tip anemones, because the bubble tip anemone is the actual host, um, besides porcelain crabs and clowns for my bubble tip anemone tank? You could get damselfish, or uh, like three-spot damsels. Those can be inside that tank. Also, um, Bengai cardinal fish are sometimes seen inside anemones. So that's a couple of different fish you might be able to put in the tank to kind of change things up. But that's about it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to put something down at the bottom, like maybe a pistol shrimp and goby pair that live in a hole. Um, that could be fun. And then, of course, you can put other things in the tank, like 
emerald crabs, hermit crabs, these are things that crawl around everywhere and keep things clean. Those would be nice. Um, Trent says, have you seen any long-term tanks with hardly any coralline that are mature? No, I guess not. Um, I think it usually is part of the maturity. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a little bit of the laziness of the person that had the tank a long time. Like I said, they don't want to clean the back glass or the side panels, and it just grows. On my own tank, you know, I, I've been kind of ignoring this end panel that's at the far end. Let me turn this for you for a second. So I have not been scraping that clean like I like to do. And uh, it, it actually doesn't benefit because, like, so this is purple. And that's a blue tort. And that blue tort basically is the same color as that wall. So it's almost an invisible coral. But if that was a black wall, the blue tort would be popping against it, which is one of the reasons I need to scrape it clean. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we got some more time. 216 people are still here. You guys are gluttons for punishment. Let's see. Odile says, what is a good DKH probe if you don't have an apex? I don't know of any kind of an alkalinity probe. Um, that was one of the reasons why we liked the Mindstream. We thought, oh, that'd be cool. It could measure alkalinity for us. But um, alkaline, okay, so let me get on this topic for a second. Let's talk about water testing. So we've, we've bounced around it a lot. We danced around it today, but it's water test Saturday, and you guys need to test. But the point is, out of all the tests we do, the one that really probably matters the most, and this goes way back to a thread on Reef Central a million years ago, uh, it was a, uh, a poll, and it said, what if you had no other test kit, and you could buy only one, which one would it be? And almost everyone put alkalinity. And I thought, wow, that's weird. <laughs> but they're right. Alkalinity is so important for our tanks. That is the number that can make or break a tank more than anything else. You know, I know you guys sweat phosphate all the time. You're always worried about phosphate. I never care about phosphate. I'm like, phosphate is whatever it is. If it's up, it's up. If it's down, it's down. I don't even care. But alkalinity? needs to be dead nuts the same number all the time. I mean, it has to be perfect. And it's such an important number. It's so, it's so much more important than pH. I do calcium and magnesium tests every single week, and I ask myself, why? Why do I even test them? They're always the same, but I just do them. It's just my clockwork. But pH is measured by the tank. I don't even care about the number. I just kind of look, oh, okay, that's what it is. I, I, and I write it down, okay, so because it's on a pH probe. And temperature is taken care of because the house is always the right temperature, and I have cooling fans if needed, and I have heaters if needed. So no matter what, the tank temperature stays where it needs to be. And if the tank ever got crazy hot, my lights would turn off instantly, and I'd get a text telling me, deal with it. Never happens. So my tank temperature, I never have to think about. Alkalinity matters. <laughs> that is such an important one. And so having a test kit, like I was saying earlier, there's so many on the market. Elos is super easy. You literally put in five milliliters in the vial, and every drop you put in is half a DKH. So you put in 20 drops, your tank is 10 DKH. Done. I can do that test, I don't know, in 15 seconds. It is such an easy test. The kit lasts a good long time. I, I don't even know how many tests are in that kit, but you get a year's worth out of it, even if you use it pretty frequently. And if you run out, I'll sell you another kit. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just such a great kit. Before Elos came out, and I like the Elos kit because the vial is glass. I don't know why. It seems fancy. And I just like it. But uh, before that, I was using one from, I'm almost positive it was Tropic Marin, and I found it at places like Petco. And I think it was like 10 bucks. And uh, it was the same thing. Every drop you put in was one DKH. So you put in eight drops, it was eight. And if it was kind of between colors, you knew it was eight and a half. You know, <laughs> It wasn't a hard test. There's so many kits out there that are complicated. Look at you guys with your Hannah checkers to check phosphate. You got to put in the vial. You got to wipe off all the fingerprints. You got to face it the right direction. You got to have the water line exactly right. You got to put it inside. You got to tell it to do its thing. Now you got to open it up. You've got less than three minutes to get the powder in there, shake it up, wipe it down, put it in, hit the test, hit the button. It's like, oh, alkalinity is a breeze in comparison to that. And then the Hannah alkalinity checker, people love it. That one's another super easy one. I think it's 10 milliliters and like one syringe and you, I don't know, you shake it up and you hit the button and boom, you have a number that you can read off the screen if you're not, if you're colorblind. So, I mean, alkalinity, that is the test to get and I, you guys should all be checking it. Uh, salinity, 
should, for the most part, be the same week after week after week. What's going to change your salinity? Something big has to happen. Like you topped off way too much fresh water. That would have to happen. Or you had a, a sump spring a leak and you lost a bunch of water. Or you bagged up a bunch of corals and your top off turned on and, you know, it replaced gallons of water that you stole from the system to give away corals or sell corals. I mean, these are how salinity changes. Or your protein skimmer overflows and goes straight into a floor drain nonstop for hours and hours. You know, that's where it happens. But most, I mean, my tank, my salinity has been 1.025 for years. It just never moves. <laughs> it does nothing. So I just check it. It's the same number. I'm like, okay. But at least I know week after week it's the same number. Um, my battle is nitrate. You guys know that. And I hate that kit. <laughs> so when Hannah came out with them, I was like, yes! And then it says measures to five. I'm like, no! So, all right. Enough about that. Um, DT Flex didn't ask me this, but uh, he said, should you remove the concrete bases that come on Indonesian coral colonies you buy because of pests? Not necessarily. You can dip the entire coral with its base, you know, with its plug, and you can, you know, inspect for pests. And if you see nothing, put it in your tank. And if you are very paranoid and you don't like anything getting in your tank, you can break the coral off. And you can throw away the frag plug or the concrete base, and you can just have just the coral, and you can plant it in your tank. Um, myself, I have no fear of what's in the ocean. I just, whatever comes, comes. And if I can get it off during a dip, great. And if I end up finding something in my tank, I just handle it. I just don't, I'm not trying to keep everything out because I'm never going to keep everything out. Something's going to get in somehow. Robert says, I'm battling green hair algae with bacteria. Will it ever end? It's just algae. Can't you beat this battle? <laughs> uh, that's a line from my uh, green hair algae video. Actually, I recommend you lower your phosphates, which I would use Phosphator X, and I would rip out everything by hand, one pinch at a time, literally pinch it off, put it in a bowl of water, rinse your fingers, put your hand back in the tank, pinch off another piece, put it in the bowl of water, rinse it off. That way, every time you reach in, you're removing it out of the system and rinsing your fingers clean, and you just do this over and over until you can't stand it. And then tomorrow you keep doing it till you can't stand it. And then the next day you do it till you can't stand it. And you rip out every bit you can. Then you add a cleanup crew and they eat what's left and then your tank is clean. And it only took a week. Mad Hatter's Reef. Thank you guys. I see. I knew somebody had a top 10 list. Why do you guys always take 20 minutes to tell me stuff? For those of you that don't know me, that I'm always 20 minutes behind the chat. Minimum. <laughs> Um, I don't understand this question. Than is saying, what salinity do you recommend before adding magnesium to a fresh water change? Um, I realize magnesium does have salt in it, so it could affect things, but unless your tank is really, really tiny, it's probably not going to do anything. Um, I, when I do any water change, I recommend that salinity, temperature, and pH be the same. And if those three match, then you can change all the water you want. And, uh, if your tank is low on magnesium, you're going to be adding more to bring it up, and you're going to be adding a lot. Um, you're going to add so much magnesium, even on a small tank, you need a lot to bring it up. <laughs> it's not, it's just this weird exponential thing. On my 280, when I needed magnesium, I was pouring in a two liter bottle at a time to bring up the magnesium level in my tank, and it took a lot. I make a gallon of magnesium a month for my tank behind me right now. And it just doses in every single day, something like 80 milliliters a day. And it just does it forever. And as long as I dose it, I see coralline appear on the glass. And when I run out, it stops growing. So, and my Montipora look much better with magnesium. But I don't fear that dosing magnesium will affect my salinity, if that's what you're asking. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster says, for the two-part dosing question earlier, I wanted to know how many days prior to starting dosing should I be testing to determine my daily usage rate for alkaline and calcium so I know how much to dose daily. Uh, one of the best ways to do this is to measure your alkalinity today and, you know, calcium, magnesium, and then don't dose anything for three days and then test again. And then you'll see the difference of how much it went down over three days. You can divide by three, and that will tell you what your daily need is. Then you have to use something like the Reef Chemistry Calculator to determine how much of each of those products you need to use to uh, 
fulfill the need that the tank had. So, I mean, there's a couple ways of doing it, but like, for example, if we were just doing a, a simple, my tank is low scenario, like for example, um, oh, perfect example. My saltwater tank had, uh, I think it had something like 156 gallons of water in it. And when I measured it, because I made that water months ago, the uh, alkalinity was, I think it was 7, and my reef was 10. And so I went to the reef chemistry calculator, I put in 156 gallons, I put in current alkalinity was 7, desired alkalinity is 10, um, I'm using baked baking soda, which is soda ash, and I hit calculate, and it said you need, um, I don't know, 9 teaspoons of baked baking soda. And so I took a bucket of water, which was like a couple of gallons of RODI water, and I put in that stuff, and then I poured it into my big barrel, and brought it right up to 10 dKH, just like that. So that's how I figured that out, and it's kind of the same principle with yours. I know it, I'm not being super specific for you, but usually the rule of thirds is you don't do it for three days, you find out the difference from the high point to what it is now, you divide by three, that tells you your daily consumption, and then you figure out what you need to bring that number up. I hope that answered your question. That's kind of how I do it. I, I haven't had to do what you're describing in a long time. So I'm kind of running off the top of my head. Let's see. <laughs> Let me read this for a second. Okay, I'm just going to post this. He says, I actually do have a you pick a topic. So he said, I have two frags of $2,000 gold Aussie torches. That's a lot of frag. And I messed up transferring from one tank to the other, and they're close to bleaching. What are your tips for keeping them alive? <sighs> well, that's the scary part. I've got a little egg can that I spent 200 on, and it's just deteriorating away, and I can't seem to stop it. Um, you could dip the coral in something gentle, like uh, Coral RX, uh, not, not that, Revive. That is a coral cleaner for LPS coral specifically. It's made by two little fishies. You could try that, like a 10 or 15 minute dip. It might be 12 minutes. It's, it's not a long dip. Just to kind of kill off any bacteria that might be within the torch that's not doing well. And then I would put it in an area where it gets gentle flow and not a ton of light and see if it kind of recovers. You know, when they're bleached, they've lost their zoanthelia inside them, so baking them with more light doesn't necessarily fix a bleached problem. Usually what it needs is they need food, and they need some time to recover. And that's why I moved my A-can way off to the edge of my tank, and I've been trying to target feed it, but it just seems to never be open. It, it's just stubborn. I think I'm going to dip it again and revive and see if I can save any part of it, because I hate to lose that coral. And I hope you didn't spend that kind of money on those gold Aussie torches. I know they're very valuable, because they're so pretty. Let's see. Uh, Robert says, could a box fish go in with a mixed reef aquarium? Some people have done it. The problem with box fish is that they, uh, you never see it happen regularly. You don't hear about it long term. It, you don't come across somebody like, oh, I've had that 10 years. That just never seems to be the words you hear. So um, maybe not a great choice. I'd have to do more research on that one because, but it's like, I, I never see it. You know, when I see them, I'm in the ocean diving. I, I don't. EDS is still at 16 before the DI. Also, new carbon blocks and filter. Could I put them in wrong? 16 could be fine. What is the TDS of the water going into the RO system itself? Because if your membranes are 98% rejection rate and your TDS is 400, then you would be getting two TDS per 100. That's eight. Two membranes is 16. That could be the number you're supposed to get. Uh, just depends on what your numbers are. Um, also, the higher the, the uh, water pressure, the better. So if you're between 60, 75, 80 PSI, that would be way better than 40, 45 PSI. Uh, Kevin says, I installed a hot water recirculating system, and hot water is fed through both of our RO and RODI systems. Besides, you can change pre-filters more often, should there be any other concerns. Yeah, you're not supposed to run hot water into an RO system ever. The uh, sediment inside the water heater itself is, uh, 
It's metals. It's not good for us. It's also water's been sitting in storage versus the cold water is constantly being used every time you rinse your hands, every time you flush a toilet, every time you do laundry, dishwasher, um, running a sink, anything, filling up a glass of water. We're constantly using water all the time, so the fresh water coming out of the cold water pipes that you're supposed to run, and warmer water can destroy the membrane on the RO system. That's why we only hook it up to cold water. We're hooking up to cold water specifically not to hurt the membrane and to keep all that crap out of the water heater from getting into the membrane. So I don't know what to tell you, Kevin. It sounds like you need to undo that. You can talk to me more about it after the show. Uh, Justin says, I have a tank about four months old, and I bought some dry rock, and about a month ago, I think he said and added it about a month ago, and it's trying to turn green. That's normal. You're going to watch the rock go through different color phases, and then eventually that'll be gone. Right now, it probably looks hideous, and uh, it'll change back to a different color later on, and eventually it'll look just like rock, and it'll be okay. Um, you scroll back up for a second, see who I'm talking to. Can't answer your question, Justin, because I can't find your first question. Um, Desert Elephant says, I've been out of the game for a while, but easing back into it. Have you seen an increase in nutrients out of switching from a DSB to the rubble in your refugium? Is a DSB or deep sand bed still viable? I like the deep sand bed. I prefer it. Now, the rubble that's down there, the calcium reactor media I used, it's doing fine. But what I need to do now is I need to rake it all over to the side and then vacuum out all the sediment that's in between all that stuff and then rake it the other direction to it. I just haven't done it. It's on my hit list of things I want to do. Uh, this month. But uh, have I seen an increase or a decrease? Not really. I'm, I keep waiting for my turf scrubber to go bonkers. Jason just posted some pictures on his Instagram that showed thick, thick algae he pulled off, and mine doesn't look like that. And I'm wondering if my refugium is doing such a good job that it's duking it out with the turf scrubber and neither one's getting what they really want. I mean, my refugium actually looks relatively healthy. It looks a little thinner than normal, and the turf scrubber doesn't look thick enough. So I'm wondering if one is fighting the other versus just kind of working in conjunction. The initial idea was that the turf scrubber would do such a good job my refugium would die and I'd have this new zone and I have no idea what to do with it. But nutrients wise, uh, I haven't seen a decrease in nitrate for example. I haven't seen a decrease in phosphate. I should just stop feeding my tank. <laughs> it's all my fault. Uh, Glenn says, have you seen any new recent pictures of the coral that you helped place in the sea and when we uh, did the Coral Restoration Foundation in Bonaire? I haven't. I was actually just thinking about them a couple days ago. I thought about sending them an email saying, how's our coral doing? Because, uh, so the backstory with this coral, um, I went to... Well, I, I'm just, the dates are wrong in my head for some reason, but I flew to Bonaire with a check for $2,000, and we adopted a couple of coral thickets down there that was donations from people that uh, chimed in or chipped in from Club Milo's Reef. And we had, you know, I don't know, 60, 70 people contribute some money, and we raised this money to adopt these thickets, which are these giant racks of staghorn acropora. And they actually put a little card down there that says Club Milo's Reef, and it's zip-tied onto the coral, and uh, that is our coral in the ocean that we adopted. It's ours. <laughs> and, you know, it... And the cool thing is, when in Bonaire, you can go around, you can see these coral thickets in lots of places because they're planting a lot. There's a lot of people adopting. You see those little cards everywhere. But we're in there. We're represented. It's pretty cool. Actually, I'd like to just go back and dive there and find the thing and take another picture of it. But no, I haven't seen, I haven't heard anything. Good question. Oh, this one is such a big topic. <laughs> Um, Mr. Reef Buster says, can you talk about coral placement in a tank? How are we doing on time? Right. Um, which corals do best where and which type of corals can't come in contact with which type of corals? Yeah, that's, that's a whole one-hour topic right there. I don't know. Um, I think we should save that for another day. 
because there's so much there. And plus, that's a super vague question because it really comes down to what are you buying? You know, and there's so many coral, I mean, I don't know, what are there, 400 coral species or something? How would we know which we're talking about specifically? Um, in general, SPS corals go up high, LPS corals go down low, softy corals go in the areas where it's darker and shaded because they don't need as much light. Um, some corals may tolerate each other for a while and then one day decide to kill their neighbor. I mean, that can happen. Um, usually corals of the same family can tolerate each other pretty well. Like zoanthids can all butt up against each other, recordias can butt up against each other, mushrooms seem to be fine with other mushrooms. Anemones can be with anemones, gorgonians can be with gorgonians. Um, hammers are okay with frog spawn, but torches have to be far away. I mean, there's that kind of thing. Um, but it's just kind of hard to cover it all. You almost need to talk about, are we talking about an LPS system? Are we talking about an SPS tank? Are we talking about a mixed reef? Um, are we talking about a species system? Cold water, warm water, I mean, there's so many things. So it's really hard to answer that. Yeah, like I said, that's more like a full topic. It, it's almost a stream of its own. Um, also, he asks, can we keep a, a RAS without a lid on the tank? I personally hate having a lid mesh on top of the tank. RASs jump, and uh, they may not jump for a while, but one day they will, and then you'll say, well, I guess I need to get a mesh top. I mean, that's kind of how we do things. Sort of like, I got robbed, let me buy an alarm system. <laughs> that's kind of what happens with us. So yeah, I, I agree, they're not pretty. Um, I do know there are certain brands out there that are really nice and there's certain companies making beautiful custom acrylic or polycarbonate tops that are screened in and have an access door for feeding. But there's like a long wait. It's like six, eight, 12 weeks to get it. And uh, they're really nice. But then I was thinking even the simplest screens that you can make yourself where you make a frame, you buy some kit from like DD Aqua, Aqua, what do they call them? So DD. It's not Aqua Studio. I always thought DD was Deltec, but it's not. Uh, anyway, DD makes this really nice screen you can build yourself. And I was thinking nowadays with 3D printing, you can actually print yourself little clips to put on the edge of the tank to drop the screen in so it's level with the top so it looks completely blended in. And I think that's pretty cool. And people are making more and more little things with 3D printers of their own, in their own houses. Like, hey, I have an idea. And they print it. And 12 hours later, they have it. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Um, Charlie says, I've noticed my RO system flow speeds up after eight hours of running. Okay. Then the TDS creeps up to one from zero. Uh, it's so, it sounds more like you're talking about the DI water, like your DI water was zero for a long time. And then it starts to show one, your resin might be wearing out. It might be time to replace that one soon. Um, speeding up, not really sure what's going on there. That doesn't really make any kind of sense mathematically because PSI is PSI and, uh, I don't know how that could do that. That's a weird one. I'm almost to the bottom of the questions. The stream must be running out. Oh, I got to the bottom. People are talking to themselves. Yay, perfect. All right, guys. I hope you guys have a great weekend. We'll have another live stream next week unless I'm out of town. Uh, I don't know that I'm going out of town, but it's a possibility that I'll be out of town. My watch is so funny. It says, you're almost there. You should stand up for a minute. I've been standing here for two, three hours. Um, I don't know. I've got a, another trip to uh, west toward the end of the month. But I, yeah, thank you. DD Jump Guard. Um, I'm thinking that uh, I'm probably I'm going to be here next Saturday for another stream. So we will do that. In the meantime, come to Club Meals Reef. Post your water test parameters. I want to see them. And uh, take good care of your tanks today because tomorrow you want to enjoy them. So I hope that you have a nice weekend. Bye, guys.